boy, you've got a lot of power with this thing. Do you see how quiet it is? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for being here today. We'll call our uh, commission work session of February 1st to order. Um, Nikki, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. All right, we have a presentation, Love Your Library Month. I believe that's Commissioner Tornga. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, do we have anyone here from the library that is? She's behind the pole. Oh, she's <laughs> jealous. Hiding. Hiding behind the books. Good morning. Good morning. Allow me to read this proclamation. Great. Love your library month proclamation. Whereas libraries connect people, materials, and culture to build and sustain a diverse and vibrant community. And whereas in a world undergoing change, Constantly, libraries provide enduring connections to the past and future of our communities, nations, and civilizations. And, whereas, the expansion of electronic networks linking libraries and their resources make possible better and more easily accessible information for library users around the world. And, whereas, libraries provide entry to important research about health, economics, housing, the environment, and countless other areas to support better living conditions and to help people lead longer, more productive, and fulfilling lives. And whereas the Dunedin Public Library offers story times, <coughs> teen programming, and summer reading programs to encourage children to begin and continue habits of reading that will benefit their personal and professional lives. And whereas the Dunedin Public Library supports a competitive workforce with basic literacy programs, computers, small business startups, job searching, and other resources to support businesses and economic development. And whereas, the Dunedin Public Library engages the people of Dunedin with services, spaces, and resources to enrich their lives and the life and lives within their community. And whereas, the Dunedin Public Library creates a welcoming environment for everyone to celebrate the joy of literacy, learning, creating, communicating, and cultural exchange. Now, therefore, I, John Toringer, by the virtue of the authority invested in the mayor of the city of Dunedin, Florida, and on behalf of the entire city commission, do hereby proclaim February 2022 as Love Your Library Month in Dunedin and encourage all residents to visit our libraries safely and provide all CDC guidelines and thank a librarian for making this unique and wonderful institution possible. Yeah. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners, thank you so much for sharing uh, the Love Your Library Month proclamation and on the first day of February. Mm -hmm. I know we are so lucky in Dunedin because every day is Library Day. Um, we have great support from our city and our residents. Uh, we have an amazing staff and just hearing all of the services that we offer, um, it's amazing what we do every day. To celebrate Love Your Library Month, our Friends of the Library are hosting their annual book sale. Um, it starts Wednesday, February 2nd and it continues uh, through the weekend, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And all of the funds raised through the book sale come directly to the library so that we can provide programs um, and ha have some uh, enhancements at our library. And especially we're working on a new library playground. So thank you for your support of our library. Um, our library was founded in 1895 before Dunedin was even a city. So it shows how important that culture and literacy is in our community. Thank you. Good. That's awesome. Thank you, John. Um, all right, we'll go to citizen input. Anybody wishing to come forward and speak to any item that is not already on the agenda, please feel free to come forward and do so. Give us your name and address for the record, and you'll have three minutes. Seeing or hearing now, we'll come back to consent agenda. Um, I just need to 
tell my colleagues we've got a couple of items to be pulled. First, we have to pull uh, the reappointment of Sue Kutsarias to the personnel board as that is an election versus an appointment. So that has to go through a different process and we didn't know that. Um, so that item has to be <coughs> pulled. Um, also, the Mardi Gras celebration license agreement needs to be pulled. Um, Jennifer will speak to that, or Jennifer or Vince. And then I'd like to ask to pull the arts and crafts road expansion since we got an email last night about it. Okay, is that all right with everybody? <laughs> yes. All right, so the balance of the consent agenda would be the work session of January, the minutes of the work session of the 4th and the 18th and the regular meeting of the 20th, board and committee appointments to the Historic Preservation Committee, um, the one appointment to the personnel review, and that's it. So can I have a motion to approve that piece of our consent agenda? So moved. Second. Okay, Commissioner Gow and Vice Mayor Kynes. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. So we'll go back to the first item, which would be uh, the reappointment of Sue Kutsaraj. Did you have anything you wanted to say, Rebecca? Um, no, I just, it'll come back to you once um, Teresa reaches out and gets um, volunteers if anybody wants to run against Sue for that position. Okay, so I think we probably need to do a postponement. So, so moved? Mm -hmm. uh, well, we don't need that. Or? How about if we do a table because we don't know the date? I don't know. Okay. It's postponement to a date certain or a table for whenever. So let's Correct. do a motion to table. So moved. Second. Okay. Commissioner Franey and Commissioner Vice Mayor Kynes, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Then we have the Mardi Gras license agreement. Um, Jennifer. Yeah, good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. There is a discrepancy in the amount of insurance required uh, in the agreement versus how much we typically require for events. And so we'd like to pull this off the agenda. We think we can get it re-executed. We've already been in, in touch with Jack Badel and, and walk it on on Thursday night. So do you want us to postpone it till Thursday, or do you want us to do a table and, and you can just do a start item? Uh, let's do start item. Okay. So I need a motion to table the Mardi Gras. So move. Second. Okay, Commissioner Franey and Commissioner Gal, thank you. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Can, I, can I ask, was that what we talked about yesterday? Yes. Okay, thank you. Sure. Motion well, passes unanimously. And then the American Craft Endeavors, we pulled that. Obviously, everybody saw the email. Um, Jennifer, uh, and I did speak with her last night about it, so she knew this was coming. Mm -hmm. you want to just give us a quick update? <clears throat> So the, um, the Scottish American Society is, is just off of Main Street, you know, accessing via, via uh, Main Street. And so we want to extend the, the road closure up to Loudoun. And the reason for that is I think there are 185 vendors uh, for this. This is the Arts and Crafts Festival. It's their largest uh, of the year. Uh, so we do need the additional space. Uh, uh, Mr. McHale sent an email to the City Commission and copied staff. It, um, he's worried about access in the future. Uh, for, you know, when we do a road closure. And so there was, was an event this weekend. I know that Trevor Davis had reached out to him and, and Vince Gizzy had spoken to him as well. Um, so we need to work with Mr. McHale as far as when there's a road closure. Uh, in the future, we'll give him the list and we'll reach out to him uh, for sure. And this was a unique situation where they asked for an extension at the last minute. Yes. Okay, so it's not a normal thing, although no. we did extend it a few months back and yes. I think it was for the same event. Correct. If I remember correctly, and um, and that had caused a problem, but I, I know Jory was working with Alan and yes, and others. The other thing, um, too, one of the things we realized, if you remember, at the commission direction, um, based on Jack speaking to us and others about our retailers complaining that the tents were right in front of their shops, mm -hmm. um, it was hindering their business, and if they could, mm -hmm. you know if it could be spread out and moved away from their front doors, it at least allowed them to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And we even asked if they could have some tents. I don't know if that ever happened, but at least we were spreading they, it out. They were more in the middle, and I did go into some of those sh shops, and they were uh, appreciative Good. that we had moved them more to the middle, so all their shops stayed open. I went right. down. Yep. And so I'd like us, as we're working through this, I see Jory and Vince, you know, to consider whether it's an extension there or an extension to Broadway. I would like to pull in the merchants 
and the chamber and you know Broadway is very sensitive to their closure I, I, I know what I'm saying believe me I hear it um, what they don't like is you know the slide being there or golf carts being parked there because they feel like it doesn't do anything for them but something like this might be different so I just want us to consider all of those things if it's an extension that way versus this way if it needs to be extended you know we're trying to help everybody so let, let's be creative is yes. all I'm asking yeah. all right so um, I just ask a quick question yep. and the whole issue of uh, when there is an extension up that way that the Scottish American can't come through the Boy Scout area is that like a thing is that a <laughs> It, it, it doesn't, right. it's, it's I just not, didn't know. Well, it's a dirt road, too. Yeah, it's not access. And right, really, but if you had to, right. I'm just saying it's a it's an yeah. option. If Well, I think actually what I'd like to do is if, if they have an event, uh, is to work with security to get those folks in to the event. Yeah, it, it just didn't seem logical that Boy, the Boy Scout group would say no. It was just maybe the our security people needed to say that that's okay, you're allowed to do that. Right, we, we can all work together to make sure that they can access, well, and we can extend. That needs to be yeah. approved. I don't know. Maybe there needs to be a secondary access to the parking lot. I don't know, or whatever. I don't know how that would happen, but look, look, yeah, let's get creative. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Nope. Okay, so uh, we're still still moving forward to approve this one request, right? That's what we're being asked yes. to do. Yes. Okay, and it's not going to interfere with the current event at SAS. No. Okay, uh, can I have a motion to approve uh, this extension? I'll make the motion, and then I'd like to add in it that we would, we will continue to check with SAS to see if we'll be, uh, if we will be impinging, if we will be impinging on them with such an extension. Yes, and we also checked with Caledonia, by the way, and we did for this event, yeah. and, okay. and they were happy about it actually. <laughs> well, that's a different mm -hmm. type of business, so. Okay, is there a second to that motion? Second. Okay, Commissioner Gow. All right, all in favor signify by saying aye. Can I make a comment? Oh, sure. Um, I, I agree with what uh, the Commissioner just said, and uh, I feel that, that that road belongs to all of the folks there, and I think we need to be very open about that, and I'm sure we can be and will be. And then second of all, um, I'm glad that you said that they don't didn't it wasn't going to be affecting them for this time because I wasn't sure if that was the case or not, but as long as it's not, then then I'll go ahead and vote for that. But I think we need to be careful. And I agree with what the mayor said. We need to try to expand this and be creative where we can and figure things out and try to, try to facilitate. So thank you. Uh, and I'll just say one other additional thing. Um, the, uh, they did mention in the email about St. Patty's Day that they have an event, but we do not have a request to extend mm -hmm. our road closure on that day. Mm -hmm. Did you have something you wanted to say, Vince? I, I did. This is the Parks and Recreation Director. The Mardi Gras event, which is um, on the 26th of February, is going to go to Milwaukee, but that's been on our road closure list since uh, uh, since August, and Alan's aware I'm of that. Not, I'm sorry. That is included in this. It's both. It's the craft and the Mardi Gras. Yes. And But their uh, SAS is okay with the Mardi Gras. As far as I know, yes. Okay. We will reach out to him directly about Mardi Gras. And there, there's been an email exchange between mm -hmm. Trevor Davis and Alan McHale. And, All right, uh, what, let's do this in abundance of caution. Please. Let's, let's hold off on the Mardi Gras piece. We're, we've got to bring back the, uh, the license agreement with them anyway. Mm -hmm. We'll just yes. bundle that together. We're likely going to talk about it on Thursday, so it won't hold up that piece of it too much. Are we approved? I didn't think we were approving Mardi Gras anyway. Was I thought it was approved? American Craft Offenders uh, because approved. that's that's yeah. what. Oh yeah, that's right. It's already approved them all. You're right. right. It is that's already right. approved. Okay, never mind. But I never just mind. think we want to be sensitive. Make sure you know how that's. We will, yeah, we will if you just report out. back we're re we're when we do the, the license extension. agreement. Today. It was already done. Right. I get it. I, I was wrong. Sorry. I'm just Mardi trying Gras. to be very cautious. That's Did all. I tape that? No, just no. <laughs> stop that. Just kidding. Just Mardi Gras. Kidding. Hey, I'm wrong a lot. Are you kidding? You're, no, you're, you're. I'm wrong a lot. Good, good. Just for clarification, Mardi Gras this Thursday. Yes. We we're hoping. Right. But don't worry about it. We're. It's already approved. You're right. And I'm sorry about that. Okay. So I have a motion from uh, Vice Mayor Kynes and a second from uh, Commissioner Gao. So all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? 
All right, motion passes unanimously, and hopefully we'll have a start item on Thursday for the rest of it. All righty. Then we have the action item, just one, uh, proposed agenda for February 15th work session. Um, any changes being asked for at this point? Possible start item. Yeah, we don't know. We don't care about that. Not at this point. Okay. On, um, can I, yes, ma'am. Is this for, th this, com this is next Tuesday, right? It'll be the, yeah, the second meeting, second Tuesday of the month. Yes. Okay, sorry, no, I've got a request for Thursday. Okay, gotcha. All right, uh, can I have a motion to approve the agenda for February 15th? So moved. Second. Okay, Commissioner Franey and Vice Mayor Kynes. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously, thank you. All right, now we have workshop items and we have the 2022 Citizens Opinion Survey. Jennifer, can you um, kind of, I was thinking about this and I'm sorry I didn't mention it to you yesterday, but can you kind of open this up and then sort of look, tell us what guidance you're looking for? Sure, absolutely. Um, and, to, and to go way back to the purpose of a citizen survey, as we start our budget cycle, uh, we go out to, uh, to the market and we ask, we ask our residents what it is their priorities are and how well we're performing in those priority areas. We did that in 2019 and we got some really good uh, feedback from our, our residents. And it's very important then that we touch base again and find out if we move the needle uh, in either direction of any of those priority areas. And we'd like to do that. We did not do that last year. You should do it every other year. Uh, as part of our strategic planning process. We did not do it last year because of the pandemic, directly because of the pandemic. So we'd like to go out to market again uh, this year in 2019 or 2022. We have prepared the, um, the citizen opinion survey for you and we have Anne back uh, to talk a little bit about the survey this year. There have been some tweaks that are, uh, some of them the result of Nicole Delfino, our new assistant to the city <coughs> manager who came on board, had a little months to put some fingerprints on this survey, which I think is a very good thing. Um, and um, and we just like your input on the survey itself. It's very, very similar, as I said, to 2019 with, with a couple tweaks, which uh, they'll talk about. So thank you, Mayor. Okay. Thank you. I'm not sure where our monitors went. Good morning, Mayor. Good Vice morning. Mayor, commissioners. Uh, Nicole Delfino here with Anne. Could you, I'm sorry, Nicole, one moment. Yes. We don't have the monitors. Does anybody know? Um, if we can. Justin? <laughs> There we go. Okay. All right. Thanks, Justin. Uh, and hang on a second. Um, I legislate. Granicus is now asking me for a password update, and I can't access it. Yeah, and the citizen opinion survey instrument on the agenda for is not coming up. It's faulting. I don't know if those are tied. I was able to access it yesterday. I was in it. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I so was I. I do have copies. If you oh, that like. that's that'd be great. That's awesome. Until we can get this fixed. I'm still working. It's a miracle. Yeah, it's it's saying password needs update. I'm saying access denied, but just to this one item. So, if you go in through the main website, that's what I'm going in. That, that's what yeah. I'm in. Is I'm not. I'm in. I legislate. Yeah. So she's not getting access. Let me refresh. And I'm not being able to access my I legislate. Okay. Refresh. And I am. Are you? I am. Yeah. But you can get the survey instrument to come up. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. The survey instrument. So let me see. Look at the survey instrument. I can get everything but the survey instrument. The second attachment. Yeah, I get it. Really? Mine's access to knife. Okay. Weird. I just refreshed. We've got a worm. Okay. Technology. Okay. All right. <laughs> While we work on that, um, <laughs> uh, just a quick look back. I, I know Jennifer kind of went over some of these items um, as far as when we launched the first uh, citizen opinion survey in February of 2019. Um, you were presented with the results in April of 2019, um, and then there were some focus groups and work <coughs> done uh, throughout that year, and then a follow-up in 2021 um, with an update as to what was completed um, in response to the survey. Um, this is some a brief overview. Obviously, if you looked at the survey response, it was a very lengthy document um, as far as what we what we learned um, from the survey um, overall that um, Dunedin is an excellent place to live uh, and that the residents are satisfied with city, uh, city services. Um, and then there's some other items that were highly rated, library, parks, and fire. Um, and that um, there were some uh, uh, 
items of concern, including the development, uh, parking, traffic, and pedestrian and bike, bike, bike and golf cart safety, which I know has been a big topic of discussion. Um, in response to that 2019 survey, um, some of the items that we uh, accomplished or addressed uh, were some focus groups, um, adding the new green, adding green space. Uh, there was a affordable housing toolkit developed, uh, some changes to the land development code, uh, some other items here, the historic preservation ordinance, uh, the multimodal transportation master plan uh, that was just recently presented, um, some additional parking options and leases. <coughs> Um, and so a few others there. And then as we look ahead to 2022, um, for the upcoming survey, I'm gonna pass it over to Anne and she'll go over some of the details here. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anne Wateen. I'm with Research Data Services. It's so nice to be back with you again. Um, the 2022 survey, which um, Nicole just handed to you, is essentially, the backbone of it is the same as what we did in 2019. And the reason that that is important is when you get the report for the 2022 survey, it will compare what we heard in 2019 to what we heard in 2022 for all of those variables that are the same, which will make that document that much more useful and will allow you to see what Jennifer was saying about where the needle has moved both in response to your actions and in response to everything that's happened since 2019. So the core of this is the same. Where we made changes were we took our experience in 2019 and we added some additional options for people to choose based on things that we heard repeatedly in open ends to, to streamline the process for respondents. Some of the questions that were pure open ends last time, we have given people options to choose. The advantage to that is twofold. It will both make the experience a little bit smoother for the user. If you remember, um, when we did our, our phone control surveys, they were taking 45 and 50 minutes. So it was taking people a significant amount of time to fill this out. And the reason that we got the response rate of nearly 1,300 people responding last time is because you have such an engaged citizenry. But we're right at the cusp of, of, of what this thing can do. So we were looking for ways to make it easier for people to use. So some of the things that were broad open ends before, we have, have given people choices based on what we heard in that 2019 survey but we've maintained the other please specify. So if they have something else to say that is not included in our list, they still have that opportunity to say it. So those are some of the kinds of things that we tweaked. Nicole also went back to um, the various departments and got their input whether there were things that should be added. So for instance, one of our latest additions was that we added the idea of whether there should be additional pickleball courts um, as, as a parks question um, that wasn't something that was on the table back in, in 2019. I know that we still have a couple of additional tweaks that we need to make, but basically this is the survey that we're proposing to use. Um, and we also have made some, some adjustments that I think will be extremely effective in how we're distributing the survey. Last year, we posted the survey on the city's website. Um, but for instance, Mayor, you posted it on your Facebook page and that was an extremely effective source. What we're going to do this time is each of those distribution channels, we're going to give a unique link so we know what is, is producing and what is not a producing. So Mayor, you'll have your very own specific link. Um, so, special. <laughs> so, so we're going to do that. But something else <coughs> that we're going to do that we did not do last time is we're going to create unique QR codes so that the library can have a QR code there at the checkout desk that somebody can just photograph with their phone and be able to fill it out. Um, the survey was always designed to be able to be completed well on a, on a mobile device. So um, we're going to do, do that, and we will have unique QR codes for those different distribution channels, which I think will broaden the scope. 
In addition to those distributions, we have a um, email list that we've developed over the years of Dunedin residents, and we added to it and then unduplicated um, email addresses that, that the city had available to them from various channels. Um, with the new communications director, we're going to do that again. So all of the new emails that have been get, gathered will be incorporated in the research effort as well. We'll make sure we unduplicate so we're not sending things to people twice. Um, and the advantage to our email platform and channel is that anybody who doesn't respond gets a couple of, of polite reminders um, so that that improves our response rate. But in addition to all of that, we also do a telephone control group so that we're getting some people who can't necessarily respond through the online forums that, that we're using. And then we compare and contrast the two, the two vehicles, or actually all of the vehicles, to make sure we're not getting um, different responses that would be a concern. So those are kind of the changes. We plan to field the survey starting in the middle of February and running toward the end of March, um, and then come back to you in your May meeting and report the findings. And th that'll give us time to look at everything very carefully um, and, and reformat that report so that you have the history and you can see how, how things are changing or not changing. Um, with the various questions that we're asking. So this was a very lovely chart in the PowerPoint, and on the screen it's not detailed to, uh, to what it should be actually showing as far yeah. as the start of the I survey. don't know what that says now. Yes, uh, so please disregard that. Um, the start of the survey, we are anticipating starting at February 14th, again running it for about four to six weeks. Um, ending uh, around March 27th. Um, then we've got a block of period of, of time for the uh, analysis for research data to conduct, about four weeks. Um, then we'll anticipate receiving a draft of the analysis, a draft of the report um, in April, in late April, and then returning to the commission um, in May uh, with the results. So, with that, are there any questions? Uh, Vice Mayor, I'll start with you. Um, Anything? No. Questions or comments? It doesn't matter, either one. Oh, good. You've saved me. Yep. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, as I was looking over this, I was thinking how important it was to see how we reacted to that first survey. And to me, that was really interesting. It was some of the things, the traffic, the bikes, the pedestrians, um, you know, overdevelopment. Um, you know, at, I was very pleased, of course, that historic preservation and the arts were important. A green space, you know, we reacted with the GDP. I mean, so I think it's a very interesting metric, and I'm very happy that we did it in 2019 so that we had that baseline to continue to see what the important issues are to our constituency and how we are meeting them. I thought that was very interesting. I did talk to um, Jennifer and I said at some point, even for a, a very small short time, I'd like Sue to explain how Zen, Zen City works, you know, and how that is another tool we're using to capture um, what's actually going on, what people are talking about, what they're worried about. Uh, you know, so, you know, I, I ask if we maybe could have Sue Burness do a, a quick little thing on that also. Yeah, we, we can set up a, like a key project under Zen City where we'll type, you know, we'll label it citizen survey. So any kind of comments, feedbacks, response, they'll track that and be able to give some good output as far as what are people talking about, positive, negative, that whole, you know, I know she kind of gives that overall, but we can drill down just for um, this, this project. Okay, thank you very much. And I see Benny, so Benny, you knew I need I meant arts, history, historic preservation, right? <laughs> okay. Mayor, may I comment on sure. Zen City? So uh, we were waiting until we got enough information via Zen City to really 
you know, put together a meaningful presentation. So if it's the direction of the commission, we can ask Sue to, when we have a, a hole in a workshop, just to sit down and tell you how it works. I think it'd be beneficial to all of you. Thank you. Commissioner Gale. Uh, uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, no, no questions, all comments, okay. all positive comments. No, it's nice to see the uh, repetitiveness and the periodic uh, approach to the surveys, just not methodically, but also it's that constant reach out to the members or the community and uh, asking for their feedback on, on how we're doing. It's also nice to take a look back at the survey that we've already done and see those measurements on how we did react to it. And, and, it, and it is nice and uh, hopefully the, the residents will see that. And so I know that uh, between the first one and this one, we had a pandemic. And so possibly not as much response as the residents would like us to have, but hopefully they'll take that into consideration and see that at least the foundations are starting to be made. So well done, thank you. We definitely heard from multiple people who responded in 2019 how much the citizenry appreciated you making this effort, um, how much they appreciated you wanting to know what they thought. So that feeling is very mutual. In, in, in and hopefully through the periodic, you, cause we also had those residents uh, with a little dist distrust. You know, we, they, we really don't know, but we really won't act. And when they can see that we do act, we can see that if we're consistently asking them for their input, hopefully that'll break down some of those barriers and those that aren't believers will really start to believe that we really do care about their input. So thank you, thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Graney. Um, yes. Um, so, and you know, one of the things that I, and I, you, you answered this really well when we had the last survey, but I just want to dig in just a little bit more. Um, you know, I think this is one of the most important things we do, this and the business survey. And, um, and for me, the most important thing of it is the statistical significance that we're not just getting, you know, let's face it, Phyllis could load it up with all those library lovers and it all, like, uh. put all your money in the library. And, um, and God bless her for that. But I'm just saying, how do we, um, how are you really controlling for that? And I know you said you control for that, but can you be more clear about how we're making sure that we're randomly getting all the areas of our community? Well, our, our database had nothing, um, was just a general population database. And that is the core of our email um, effort. And then we added to it, we layered on top of it emails that we got from the city as well. Um, but we know in our database where the emails came from, whether they came from our general population database or whether they came from, th that's, that's a variable that populates in each survey. So we can cross tab and make sure that we're not getting just a library user perspective, for instance. That is also the point of providing a unique QR code to make sure that we're not creating some sort of statistical bubble of a certain kind of user that is going to influence the survey. And if that is the case, then we can weight things um, proportionately to, to make sure that, that we're not doing that. And that's part of the reason that we built in a little more analysis time as well. Um, so we can compare those just general population surveys to um, surveys that come from the mayor's Facebook group because those people may, you are absolutely right, may look different. And we can make sure that we're not getting, we're, we're not skewing the survey because we're bubbling a certain population. Yeah, like I'm thinking like uh, responses to the mayor versus Commissioner Torn, this would be very like different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, no, no, that, I mean, obviously, uh, all kidding aside, that's really important. And that, um, I think, compared to what we did in the past, which was very, you know, informal kind of surveys without statistical significance, that's what you bring to the table and why I think the surveys the last time were so meaningful. And I'm really interested to see how these turn out. So, And Commissioner great. Franey, too, if I can add, um, you know, there's some definers in the survey. So there's a location indication questions as far as where you live, and then we also have a demographic. So we can break that down, make sure we're kind of 
meeting all those groups, um, that you know we're not seeing something swayed in, in one group versus the other, and that we're hitting the entire city, not just certain pockets. So and that was actually really helpful last time to get some sense of the quadrant that, that some of the responses were coming from. So and we, that's we did compare our de demographics that we got from the survey versus the census to make sure that we weren't skewed to older people, for instance, because they tend to have the time and the interest in doing surveys, you know, that kind of thing. Right. So we, we, we did compare those, our demographics against census demographics to make sure what we were getting was represented. But when you pull in people that don't have emails, how do you, how, what do you do? Do you call them? Do you? I mean, yeah, yes. So, um, and we don't do a huge number, but we do a control group kind of mm -hmm. survey to make sure that, again, that, that, what we're, what we're hearing when we talk to people isn't different than what we're getting when they're self-completing. Okay. I mean, do people do now, like, by text, like, you know, sending, hey, you know, you get everybody's cell number and you text, hey, survey on such and such link. I mean, do you do any of that, or is that just still we not? Have, we have done some of that. Those surveys tend to not be this kind of scope. Um, yeah, they're, they're shorter. They're, yeah. yeah, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Um, I mean, the only other thing, I mean, I like, and I, we, I was talking to the city manager a little bit about it, that I know the, the comment section always adds a little, you know, flair, but, uh, and it makes a, a lot for us to read, but I find it to be very helpful. You know, you really kind of get some things really come to life. You have to be careful because some people comment, some people don't. So <clears throat> that's where you can get kind of a lack of statistical significance, but you also get kind of a, a good flair about what people's real feelings are, you, good and bad. You get the juicy details that aren't just, <laughs> yes. uh, I'm very <laughs> satisfied. Good way, good way to put it. Um, and, and that's important. Um, you know, we did not want to lose that yeah. um, from, from what you'd gotten. And people took time <clears throat> to tell you what was they on did. their mind. Um, in ways that just saying, you know, I don't like traffic could say. I mean, they, they were very specific, which gave you very specific things to work with. So, so we knew that that was important and that very much has been maintained here. I have one last question, um, and I'll just make a comment. Um, number 9R, I guess it is. Um, as a resident, what are your top public safety concerns in the city of Dunedin? So the first thing that's on there is traffic vehicular safety. I mean, and that happens to be what everybody picked as number one. Should, I mean, should it be the first one listed? Should it be mixed in? So it's not, does that bias people? We can um, randomize it mm -hmm. so that everybody gets a different list. Okay. Good. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I kind of think it's probably still going to end up be one, but it would be interesting oh, to see it be. mixed up a little bit this right. We, we can absolutely do that. Okay. Um, and I wanted to mention to you, I know the numbering looks a little bit wonky. The, the question numbers, this is a little technical, but the question numbers are the variable names in our data set. So we have maintained them to be consistent with the 2019 survey. And we reversed the, the order of the um, parks and rec questions and the public safety questions, because public safety seemed a little bit hard for people to wrap their head around as the very first question. Um, the, the respondents, the, the residents, will never see those question numbers. They don't, they don't appear on their version of the survey. What they see doesn't look like this. This is just formatted to be an easy, mm -hmm. an easy format to hand to you. Um, so they get something that's formatted to be visible on, on, a, on a mobile screen, and it doesn't show the question numbers. So all the ones that have ours are something that we tweaked something about, um, which helps us when we analyze the data as well to know that it's not exactly consistent with what had gone before. But we can absolutely randomize those responses so that not everyone is seeing traffic first. No, that's great. That's awesome. Um, my only comment is, <coughs> just to, you know, so I'm speaking to the choir, but um, this is such an important thing we do in the age of social media and all the stuff that we get hit with and, you know, uh, lots of rabbit holes, good and bad. You can go down to think you're doing the right thing. You know, this is what, you know, keeps us on track to statistically look at what everybody's thinking. And so it's, it's very, very money, money well spent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a number of questions, and I'll just kind of 
go down the list, but the, the, first, the first question I have is uh, this word statistic or statistical. Um, is, this a, is this a study that we would say is statistically sound? Yes. Because? Because we are taking a random sample, because um, we know what the population is, because we wound up getting um, 1,277 responses, which um, considering the population gave us a standard error of plus or minus 2.7%, um, which can give you confidence that you weren't just hearing from the people that you hear from, all the, the squeaky wheels that you hear from all the time, but a general, um, a general representation of the population. So is there a test that you run on that? For example, what would have happened if we had received 900 inputs? Um, if you had received 900 inputs, your standard error would have been slightly higher than, than 2.7, but not significantly higher. And then Statistically, I if you have over 384 uh, surveys, you are at the 95% level of confidence having a standard error of plus or minus 5%. That's sort of the, the, stand, the gold standard for, for market research. However, that doesn't apply when you're trying to break out what did people in the north quadrant think versus people in the, in the, in the southwest quadrant, you know, as an example. So having that larger sample size gives you um, better grainage when you start subdividing that general population into other markets of interest. So do we violate that randomness by going out to the same people then that responded previously? Um, no, I don't think that you are. I think that that will have benefit um, but we are also refreshing that list. We're refreshing it on our side and also from the city side. So it won't be entirely the same population. And then we are adding in um, being able to survey at various community points. So, so I think that we're creating more touch points this year than, than last time and that we won't have the same, you know, the same 2007 D7 people, uh, same 1,277 people responding. That, that won't be the case. So that's my second question, but let me come back to the first one then still. Um, the randomness is really not random when you select the people that you're, that you're going to, in my, in my opinion, but I'll leave, that, I'll leave that for you. But we're not selecting the people no, that but, we're going to. But that's who you're addressing. You're going back. And I like the idea we go back to them, but I'm not sure about the statisticalness of that. But that's another subject. Um, how are, would you just respond and just tell me each, each collection area method uh, that, that we're going to use for this survey? So we have our email database, which we have expanded and updated. Um, we added on top of that emails that were provided to us by the city last year that came from various distribution channels. Um, that we are adding to this year because that's been expanded with your new communication director. So that's our email blast. Last, last time we additionally posted the survey on the city's Facebook page and um, website. We will do that again with unique links for both of those places. Um, there were also distribute, um, last, last year, the, the Dunedin Chamber gave us their email addresses and they were incorporated. Um, so we'll use that same group that we had, but again, all, all of those emails have been updated and refreshed. Anybody who opted out last time will not be sent to again. Um, we, we honor all of, we've maintained all of that and we honor all of those opt out requests. Um, so that, that's how the email database was constructed. Um, l last time, um, Jennifer and Lael had reached out to us and asked us about having surveys available at the library and at the community center, at various places that would extend our reach. Um, and it was cost prohibitively expensive to, to do that as a paper copy and then enter it. Um, 
So this QR code was our way of, of dealing with that. And, and so I think that that will expand our reach um, very cost effectively um, and help to, to extend the population that we're able to talk to. And then lastly, we do our control group survey where we do call people that we did not have email addresses for to make sure that, that we have some inclusion there as well. So um, of, the people, of the people that you contacted by telephone previously, mm -hmm. what percent was that approximately of, of the? It was a very small percent. Yes, As a control group, it doesn't need to be large, but um, I believe we talked to um, 20 or 25 people, something like that. It, it was not big, but enough to let us know that we were getting similar answers from them to what we got from the self-completed surveys that came from those various... So that's a very, very small group that you, that you yeah. reach out to by telephone. Yeah. The, that, it, that's a very time and labor intensive part of what we surely. do. And how are those numbers selected? Um, so from our database that we've gathered, we know names of people that we don't have email addresses for, and so we, we, match, we phone matched them, and those are people that we've reached out to and or people who, who didn't respond, yeah. And if somebody begins the process and stops in the middle or part of the way through, or what, what percentage of the way through uh, are they continued as, a, as an import? So, uh, import? Um, we, can, the, we can capture partial surveys. Um, the, the, the survey software does that. Last year we did not include it, anyone who didn't get to the point of submitting. Now, um, from, the, from the report, we're, we're not requiring anybody to answer any question in the survey. Um, and we did delete some surveys that were so incomplete that they were not useful. Um, we, we also exclude people who don't live in the city anymore, you know, or um, for whatever reason didn't, didn't qualify for, for that reason. So we did get some <coughs> surveys that were incredibly incomplete um, and, and, and were not used. But if somebody just doesn't want to answer you know, question 10, we did not exclude them. We provided you with the information of what proportion of people responded. Is there a guideline you use for that? Is that? Uh, of how incomplete? Um, no, I don't have a specific guideline, but we went through the data very carefully. Um, so if we were seeing that there was, we, we, we can see if there's somebody who's not answering the majority of the questions. Um, and we look at the balance of what they did provide and, and sort of see whether it has weight and merit, you know, that they're, they're giving us information that's useful. Um, as you know, we're a coastal city. And, um, and, and so I don't necessarily have to bring, there were things that, uh, that are in this that, that relate to that. Um, and, and I don't think we wanna change the survey at all because of that reason, but it is a major point. And there are major things that relate to a coastal city, um, such as, and some of those are mentioned in various areas here, but under that concept of, of the fact that we are a coastal city. Um, do you feel like, and, it's, and, and many of those subjects are embedded in here. Um, do you feel like that's sufficient for us as a coastal city? By coastal city, I mean uh, we have our entire side of our city is up against the coast, a very important part and thing in Florida, and people are concerned about the coast, they're concerned about our causeway significantly, um, but then access to the water and access to views and parks and things like that, and again, some of that is in here. Um, should, do you think that perhaps that could be um, something that could be included into here, or do you think we'll get enough of that out of this? I definitely heard those sentiments expressed by respondents, um, both in the answers to the questions and in, and in the open-ended comments of how important <coughs> that is to your constituencies. Um, you know, so I think it is capturing that that sense um, and we did add some additional as part of our tweaks we did add some things about water quality and uh, because we were hearing them in the in the open ends 
So um, I, th I think that it's covered. Um, and I think that, that you have respondents for whom that's a huge priority. And they definitely said so last time. You know, we, we heard it. Uh, now I'm going to ask you a question that's, that's complicated <coughs> and not comfortable for me to ask because it can be misconstrued and I can be, uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, so you get a communication from, or a group of, of emails from somebody like the chamber, okay? And yet we have many people in the city that are not involved in, in organizations, many, many mm -hmm. people as you know. Do we skew the results because of some of those gatherings? Well, as I said, we've tagged every single response um, and it happens in the background so that we know where that came from. So we, we can see whether or not that, that is an issue. And the core base didn't come from any of those places. It came from uh, emails that we had purchased, um, from lists that we'd gathered over our 35 years of, you know, well, we don't have any 35-year-old emails, but <laughs> that we've gathered over our period of time of being a market research company working in this market. So that's the core, isn't the chamber list or isn't the city's list, it's, it's our list, which is general population. I'll just say thank you for the answer, that answer. Um, so when, when we uh, come out and state that, that this is what the people said they wanted, okay, I think we, we always have to be a little bit tongue in cheek with that, I, I would think. Question, first question is, is statistically sound, okay? And then the second question is, is if, regardless of whether it is or not, is it meaningful to us? And that's why we, that's why we sit up here, I guess. Mm -hmm. So it's always, an, it's always like a would you rather. If I had $10, would you rather that I spend the $10 on uh, us having lunch together, or would you rather have me give you the $10? Um, I, I can help you answer that if you if you like, but I would take number two on that. <laughs> one. Um, but nevertheless, um, so we we get into some of that. I think we, as we look at this, it's it's sort of a would you rather? Do we get some of that out of that? Is that sort of positioned this way? So or we or just do do you like? So we have made every effort to make sure that. Um, as much of the population has the opportunity to answer the survey as possible, which is what you need to have to have a random survey and to have representative actionable results. And we've then taken what we've gotten afterwards, compared it back to, to census data to make sure that we're representative and not skewed. So we are um, doing everything in our power to make sure that that survey that you're getting is representative of not just um, special interest groups, but the general population of Dunedin residents. So I make that, I make, that's, I'm going to leave that as my last question. I leave that for us to make sure that we put in, put in the pipe as we smoke it, um, that this is, a, this is a study that comes out. We do know that it, 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 you're proposing that it is statistically sound. Um, the questions are, 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 are sufficient. Um, but then we always have to, we always have to look at, at, at who's, who do we think is really kind of giving some of those answers, and then what do other people think? I, I, I make that comment more to us here than, than to you, um, is that we used to always ask the question, um, do you, would you like more racquetball courts, would you like more tennis courts, or would you like more, and, or would you like more um, uh, pickleball courts? And then do you play pickleball? Or are you, are you a pickleball person? Or some question about that, because that sort of takes, sort of affects the validity when you're trying to make a, a, a decision, a business decision that's where you're going to spend your money. Um, or, or what the product might look like. So I appreciate that very much. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, 
I had a couple of uh, some things that I kind of want to know. So I, I won't take us down a rabbit hole, I promise. Um, so question number 17, when it talks about what do you think are the most significant issues caused by the pace of Dunedin's growth? It, it and, and Jennifer, I apologize, I didn't mention this to you yesterday, but I, I really just thought of it this morning. So one of the things we know, right, um, is that our growth, at least we believe we know this, our growth isn't any different than what's happening in Palm Harbor or Clearwater or Pinellas County. We are, at least in my feeling and from the different boards I serve on and what I'm hearing, that doesn't mean our residents believe that, but you know, we're not doing anything differently. As a matter of fact, we're probably more protective than they are. That's the question I think we need to be asking. I'm not gonna try to wordsmith it for you, mm -hmm. but I think we need to be asking the question, do you feel something to the effect of how are we doing as compared to Pinellas County on a whole when it comes to our growth, our traffic, because that question covers all of that. And maybe it's just doubling the question. You know, <clears throat> how do you think we're doing, but how do you think we're doing as compared to Pinellas County? I think that's important to, to ask our residents to think about, number one, because we're, with this question, without the other question, we're assuming that all of this, I already know how they're gonna answer that question, because I see it all over social media. Mm -hmm. But I think for two reasons, I want, the, I want our residents to actually think about it and say, hmm. And I want to know, once they've thought about it, what they really think. Do they think we're outpacing Pinellas County? Do they think our traffic in Dunedin is worse than Pinellas County? I think that's a really important question to ask. So however you determine, and again, I'm not going to try to figure that out, but I, I really think it's a two-prong kind of a thing. I think that's Because um, really it makes them think that, you know, it's not just Dunedin that's in this situation, but it's also, are we doing better than they are? Or are we doing worse? Because that would worry me more. If they said we were doing worse in the traffic arena or affordable housing or what, whatever is, all the different things that are under here, right? That would, that would really make me worry. And I, I do wanna just add, and I'm, Jennifer may have gone over this, but in, for question 16 and then 17, the only way that a respondent will see 17 is if they selected in 16 that the city is growing and developing too quickly. So then they're given 17. So if they respond it to, you know, has the, right amount, has the right amount of growth or is, is growing, you know, is not growing and developing quickly enough, they don't give that question as an option. Well... So. But I'm going to tell you, if you go back to the last one, the last thing, you're going to see most, what most people are going to say. And that's how we... So, and I don't just, I don't disagree with them. I mean, I really don't. I just, I think we need to clarify. Because, and the other piece of this is tourism. Because I can tell you right now, it's tourism causing our traffic. It's not development. And we heard that in the survey. When we went back and did the traffic focus group Fact. After, all over Pinellas after the survey, we, um, now this is only 10 people, so <clears throat> not at all representative. Right. But when we went back and did that traffic focus group, we took the census population data for Dunedin, and those 10 people looked at me like I had two heads and said, that, that can't be right. You know, the, that they thought their perception of growth was that it was much bigger than the census d documented growth was. So I think you are absolutely right. Yeah, and so that's my point. I feel like we have to dig it mm -hmm. a little bit more is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. And I think somehow we have to feed in tourism in here somewhere. Again, I'm not going to tell you where, but I'm going to tell you what I'd like to know. Mm -hmm. Do our residents realize that traffic is not being caused by development, it's being caused by tourism? How do, how do they feel about tourism? And I thought I saw it in here, and then I went, when I looked in there, I couldn't find it, but maybe it is, you know, I thought I saw some, something about their, 
there some question some and it could be multiple boxes something about tourism and its effect how do you think tourism affects us mm -hmm. or something and again I'm, I don't know the right question but I do think it's a it's something that we need to address because we see it all the time. We see that we, we care more about tourists than we do about our residents. I've heard that a hundred times. I don't agree with it, but I'm just saying, I've heard it. It is a concern that I've heard, especially in the last several years because of the sheer numbers of increases in tourism in Pinellas County. Mm -hmm. And that does cause problems that not us, but our county are not addressing. So I think it helps us in multiple ways, right? Mm -hmm. um, Mayor, could I? Sure. But I, you know, just to tag on the question to the experts, how would you do that? You know, being that we want to try to keep this pretty close to the same, not adding too many layers. Like, can you do it? Right, and we need and we need to watch length. Um, I think that we need to sit back and uh, go back and put some pencil to paper and see how how doable it is without without yeah and again I'm just saying I I, yeah, I don't know the right way to approach right it and I understand you were trying to keep this very consistent mm -hmm. um, um, but I do think yeah. understanding how our even if you don't want to talk about tourism I'll I'll get away from that but I I do think it's important to. Uh, for, the, for our residents to think about it and to answer the question on how we compare to the county overall. Because I think that'll tell us a lot. If that was what I was going to beg for, uh, I I'd want to know that. I think that's really interesting. Yes, ma'am. I heard you say, did you say something? Um, you know, I guess the question sort of boils down to, are we too rarefied? I mean, are we centering only on Dunedin when we are a part of the whole? And I think that's, that's what, what trying I'm trying to, to say. say, you know, because, you know, everybody. I, I do think there's a way to we can work on some wording for a question that kind of asks that comparison. Yeah. How do you feel? Because it's kind of like when you're asking in the bubble of Dunedin versus, Fair you know, because I just I drove to, you know, South Pinellas County and I was like, ha ah, yesterday. <laughs> right. No. It, and that's my point. I, I, I just think we can get a lot out of it. And I know you guys can figure out how to do it and what to do and if it works. You know, I'm just, I'm just pointing it out because it's something I'm dealing with in other areas. And it just comes at me all the time. It's like when people talk to us about affordable housing. You know, if the counties, um, and this is in no way a condemnation of the county, but if they're if their um, criteria for giving us money or helping us and the state are too red tape and too difficult and too requires too many things, then we can't get the money to do affordable housing. Is the county doing more affordable housing? Not enough, but so it's a, it's a rampant problem. It's not just the need. But when you're a Dunedin resident, that's what you're focused on because that's where your taxes are going. And so I understand. I'm just trying to get a sense of how they feel we're doing as compared to the whole, the part, the sum, the part of the whole. And I think that'll tell us where we can really micro focus a little bit more. And, you know, and two, I mean, I know we've talked about how similar we want to keep it because that is going to help us identify all those things that we did do. Did they change opinions? Right. So that was very focused. But, you know, as we look ahead to future years, I think, adding, you know, adding this question, I mean, we may end up, you know, the next time around dropping some questions sure. and, and, you know, make, making it more focused on some of these other items, if that's what we see the continued mm -hmm. trend to look like. So, um, I think they're, you know, let us work on a little, a little wording for that Is question. Is everybody okay with that? Well, I, I, I like yeah. to make a comment. I, I'm, I'm agreeing. I mentioned, I mentioned the coastal city thing, but not to put into here because we're comparing this to, and that's almost the same concept. And two of the, two of the biggest things that I am hearing right now currently was I'm talking to, a, I'm trying to talk to even more people than what I normally do, um, is number one, um, is about that tourism. Um, and some of them, I'm being asked questions like, um, 
you know, why are, we, why are we doing all this tourism? Or we don't like this tourism, and others love the tourism, and they live on the tourism. So it's a great point. We ought to, then maybe that needs to be a separate study. Maybe the study about the coastal city, because these are big subject matters. And I, and, th and I do think we'll see, we might, I mean, asking that question, we may be able to see a difference in responses, especially in the citizen survey, maybe versus, versus business. the business. I, I got to so, tell you, tourism, yes. Yes. I do see the importance or the, you know, and again, maybe the tourism piece is a part of the same question you've already asked somewhere else. And I, I thought I saw something in there. Yeah, I thought it was in here too. But I couldn't. I'll go back and look. Yeah, I do, I do just think that's important because I do think the citizen mm -hmm. versus the business is going to be different. And I think there's some education there. And, and, and I was going to bring this up in the, in the discussion and in, in comment section, but I won't. I'll bring it up now then. And that is that, that I think maybe we need to do that as, we're, as we are growing to the level that we're growing and we're starting to hear some rumblings about that and there's some input. If nothing more, input is important, that people get to have an input on that subject matter. And so don't just input me. I sit and say, now what do I do with this information? Um, well, maybe we need to handle that because it is a big question. Tourism, what, where, where do we want to go with this? The question becomes for them, some of them to me is, it seems like we're spending a lot of money. Oops, boom, there we go. Here we go, now they're, I, know, I know where they're gonna go with this. It's why are we spending all this money for the tourism? And then the, somebody that's in tourism says, well, because we're adding money to the city, making it more valuable. So the survey alone would be interesting, and then perhaps education or communication about what it is that we're doing and why we're doing it and how people really felt about it. I think that's maybe a separate to this. I, I don't mean, to, I'm not arguing, I'm not uh, having a, uh, uh, a discussion against what you're saying. I'm just mm -hmm. saying maybe that's a good way of doing it because it is a very, very important question for us. I'm hearing a lot of that and, of course, have always heard a lot about the coastal, the coastal city and, and when well, we even have a coastal vernacular. Um, yeah, and, but, and as the results come back from this, then we'll be able to kind of focus on, you know, a future focus groups, education, all the all the things that, you know, we did the first round to address, you know, do we need to, you know, do more of the same? Do we need to tweak our education, our outreach, um, you know, hold town halls, you know, that sort of thing so that we can then, you know, drill down on some of these subjects. Thank you. Yep. There's nothing, there's nothing worse for me and I would assume for everybody that's sitting up here is when somebody comes to us, they deliver an issue, deliver an issue, we get it from this person, this person, this person, and we really don't do anything with it. Because, well, what, how do we do this? What do we, how do we start? So I say it and somebody else disagrees with it. We don't have any information about it. So really to enter into the discussion about it, you really have to have the input for that. And it's gotta be good and significant input. So I'm just gonna also say like with question 17, it, it does follow the 16, right? Question 16 is what do you think that the city, and do you think, it says, and do you think that the city of Dunedin is growing and developing too quickly? You have choices, four choices. Has the right amount of growth, is not growing enough, or don't know. And then you say it pops up. To say that is growing too quickly. Let's say that's what they. Right. Because I was going to say the question 17 is very leading. What do you think are the most significant issues caused by the pace of Dunedin's growth? But it's only asked of those people who said Right. That. And then that's maybe where you would put, do you think, ask these same things as compared to the county? Because I, it's assuming someone thinks these, it's making the assumption that there are these things being caused by the growth. And the and these, but I understand what you've yeah, done. These selections, so that this specific question was an open-ended question that resulted in hundreds of right. So of you comments. gave these things. Gotcha. So we we, we codified them so that we can actually you know understand this percentage instead of going through and right, right, as right. A, as a cert, you know analyst, gotcha. you know making those okay. assumptions. The other thing, completely. Well, I. Is everybody okay with adding something about us? How do you think we care about the part to the whole with the county? I think However, they choose to do it. Yeah. 
without skewing things? I think that that'll be very meaningful yeah. to the respondents. Yeah. We heard comment after <clears throat> comment, not comparing to the county, but comparing to Clearwater. Right. Um, thinking that you were doing better or not wanting to become Clearwater or right. um, being kind of your nearest big. I can answer that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I think it's, friend. I think I it's know, something no, we, that's we on the respondents' Jeff, minds. are you okay with that? Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. Jeff? I, I am. I, I do think it is partly education that John said, because it, it you know, when people come at me with overpopulation, yeah. things like that, I mean, in 84, when I started with the city, we were like 35,595. And we're what, 38? And we are like 2,000 more now. I know. So, and people are like, what? Yeah. And no, uh, it's true. It, it, it's, it's tourism that's the people. Yeah. That It's well, not it, it's our tourism, and it is that drive-through. Of course, yeah. it's definitely tourism for Honeymoon Island. Yeah, yeah. But, but anyway, I, if there's a way to get at that perception so then we know how to target the education, that's probably a really good idea. That's why I bring it up. Yeah. I just feel like it needs to start yeah. to get in there. The other thing I, and I know you asked this question last on the last one, but I, I didn't remember it being worded this way, and this is question number 20. It confused the hell out of me. And I've been in this business for 15 years, and I should be able to understand really what that means. And so to me, I thought it would be very confusing to the resident. So it says, currently the city of Dunedin receives approximately 22% of your Pinellas County ad valorem property tax payment. I mean, why wouldn't we just say, our tax rate is X. It's so simple, and that's what they actually know. I don't know. I, I think I, I actually like it because most people think of their taxes. That's my whole big amount of money, right, and they don't always segregate it in their head. So I, I get what you're saying. Maybe there's a better way, but I uh, actually but I like, your way would make me more. See, I was like 22 percent. I'm like, how do I know that? I mean, I don't even know that, what and I should like? know that. A lot of people don't do think, oh, which little part is Dunedin? Right. They don't realize. Question number 20. Same question. Question, question. Yeah. We didn't change. Yeah, we didn't change. You got the water. Anything of it. Well, I, I think it provides an opportunity to actually let them know in case they don't know. You, We are actually only getting 22%. We don't get a smaller, you know, smaller or larger portion of it. I think it's important, too, because people are going to think their property taxes are all going to you. I, I think it's I think very important. That oh, OK. Realize. Well, then, see, yeah, that's, that's exactly. what I didn't pick up on. Yeah, but I, that's what I'm saying. I did not pick up on that. And I know this stuff inside and out. So if I didn't pick up on it, I'm worried that somebody else won't. It, maybe it's just rewording it, using the same 22 percent. But am I just am I? You know, I, I, maybe there's a better way to say it, but I definitely think sometimes people are like, that whole tax bill somehow is on us, and mm -hmm. it's not. Right. So to and me, why, why aren't making you doing sure more it's clear that this piece yeah. Right, so, okay, itself. so let me just read, maybe I'm, maybe uh -huh. it's my issue. So let me read it out loud. I mean, I, when I read it, I was like, huh? So currently, the city of Dunedin receives approximately 22% of your Pinellas County ad valorem property tax payment. Which of the... Jeff, you look like you're going to add something. Yeah, well, well I, <clears throat> I'm a little confused on why we're using a device for the purpose of trying to get as much information from our residents as possible. And we're also trying to educate them on this one little piece. And I think that's where the confusion is. I don't, I don't think we're educating them at all just because we have that little statement in, in a survey. I, I think they blow right by that and all that they read are taxes. Are your taxes too high or too low? They aren't focused on the 22%. Um, so I think if you're going to educate them, then break the entire tax down. Here's where your taxes go. Boom, 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 boom. Do you think they're too high or too low? And I will say... Because when you say the 22%, the first thing I think of is where's the rest of it going? I don't know. So you really haven't... That's what I'm saying. It confused me so by the way it was... Working. Either just say taxes or tell them the entire pie. Yeah, but if you tell them the entire pie, then... They're telling you, do you think all your taxes, which is like, you know, everything, Pinellas County and Juvenile Welfare Board and PSDA, and it, that, to me, tells us nothing. I just want to know, what do you think about our taxes? Oh, and a lot of well. people do put the rest of us on us. So I think it's critical. Like, hey, if, if my tax bill is $5,000, okay, 22%. I think it's too much. I think it's too little. 
and, and I, you can I mean, maybe there's a better way to say it, but I, 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 I think if you get like too... Any, I, well, I don't want to go down... Uh, get I too complicated, I, people are going to be like... I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do yeah. that either. I promise you that. But I do wish it could be said something to the effect of... And, and I'm not trying to wordsmith. It's just... Even if there was a statement, Dunedin gets 22% of the total. I don't know. No, that's not how it kind of that's, that's what it says. Well, word it's, smithing could, is sense. How about just the word sense? But I, I, I don't know. I, it just I like confused me. It, it confused me. I didn't feel, and I really tried to read this as a just a everyday resident. Well, are we are we ask, asking that question? Are we asking them in general? I, are we asking them if their taxes are too high? Or are we asking them about that percentage that we get? Is that too high? Should we get less than 22%? Should we get more than 22%? No, we set our own rate. So. Well, I, I, I know, but, but what is the, how does the resident reading that? Well, so I, how I would read it is, I know what I pay in taxes annually. 22%, which is basically a fourth of it. Okay, do I think that's too much or too little? I think it's a pretty good okay, deal so myself, you an, but that's a So you think the question is focused on the 22%? Totally, because that's the part we control. Okay. You know, if you if you read your tax thing, it says exactly what all these you know portions are going to, and it's a long list. And I don't think that you can include all those lists. No. So I really thought it was saying, you know, read your tax and your ad valorem statement, and it will tell you all the entities that it goes to, and of that, twenty two percent comes back to us. I I didn't have any issue. Okay, so. In my own head, and again, I'm not trying to wordsmith it. It's just I want to make sure it's clear. In my in my head, how I had to say that to myself was, out of your total property tax bill, Dunedin gets 22%. Is that too much? Is it not enough? Is it whatever? It, that's just re it, but that's how I had to understand it, which is not what you're saying. You're saying then Eden receives 22% of your Pinellas County Avalorum property tax. Oh, so many people think their tax bill, like you said, is all coming to then Eden. Mm -hmm. So to make a statement that says it's not puts their head in the right place. You're assuming they know that. They don't. I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to make our residents look stupid. But this or something. Makes, right. They but do. This makes an informative comment that this is how much we get. I mean, you may I'm have just to saying have reword it so to, to tell them you don't, everything you pay is not coming to Dunedin. And mm -hmm. I, will, I will say, based on the last survey result, and I think I just, from recall, um, I think the majority were in the about right. I don't yeah. think I, that I was think we were in the 70% exactly the same. It was worded yeah. the same. And we had, exactly. yeah, like, thank okay. you. 70% were about All right. right. If, it so. was word, if it was worded the same. But you know what? Maybe you guys can talk about it. Ask some, you know. I don't know. Just it just off the cuff and see if that you know if they're if it's making if it's passing the smell test or not. I think you know, if we can keep the information the same. But if we can yeah, yeah it just confuses me. We will make a little. And, and I mean, I'm a data wonk, so numbers. Are, I'm not afraid of numbers or percentages. It, those things, mm -hmm. I'm good at math. <clears throat> I mean, you know, it just okay. it confused me. So anyway, that was those were the comments and. Um, Jennifer, I wanted to ask you a question. You feel, you feel the way we approached it last time and the way we're approaching it this time is statistically sound, correct? I do. Okay. That's all I need to know because that's your job to ensure that it is. Yes. All right. Uh, what are you looking for out of us? Just the feedback you've received? Just and what we got. Anything else? Just what we got. You recall last time in 2019, there, were, there was a lot of conversation and there were numerous additions to the survey itself from the city commission. Yeah, you didn't get that today? No. No, we got some, some additional tweaking, which we anticipated, and this is all we need. We'll, we'll incorporate some of your comments um, that we had consensus direction on in the survey and send it out. Okay. All right, why don't we take a little break before we jump into the over overlay cool. discussion? Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you.
right, we'll call this meeting back to order. Uh, we have a start item, which is the review and discussion related to the development of the South Dunedin overlay. It's an update. It's not a decision thing, you know, or anything like that. So um, can I have a motion to place this on the agenda? So moved. Okay, Second. Vice Mayor Kynes and Commissioner Second. Gow. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. All right, we have, um, Jennifer, did you have, why don't you tell us uh, what you're looking to get from us today? Thank you, uh, Mayor. So uh, the City Commission actually uh, directed staff to broaden the scope for Kimley Horn. Uh, when you first saw us, the uh, parameters of the overlay, it, it was essentially elements that we should incorporate in the overlay. We moved, we took some steps forward, we actually codified it, the overlay itself, and then the South Dunedin overlay in two different, two separate ordinances we would need to do a, a land development code amendment to incorporate those into the code of ordinances. The city commission at that time requested that Kim Lee Horn and staff return to the commission uh, right around this time frame uh, to give you an update and report on where we were uh, in that effort in particular and also directed staff to go back out to the public and get their input specifically on those two ordinances uh, once they were drafted. So we want to give you an update of exactly where we are right now and what the timeline looks like from here on in. So okay. thank you, Mayor. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Gentlemen? Yes, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners, thank you. Good morning. Uh, George Kinney on behalf of the Community Development Department. I not much to add to what Jennifer just articulated. Um, this is a follow-up meeting to get your, uh, to really provide you an overview of that, of those ordinances, what's kind of in those ordinances, and you know, where the discussion has gone since that, since that public workshop meeting back in October. Um, I will give you very quickly the dates moving forward. Uh, the commission workshop today is will precede an additional public meeting that's currently scheduled for February 15th at the Hale Center. Um, that will be followed by an LPA uh, uh, consideration in March and, of course, two commission readings in April. So we hope to have this thing wrapped up by certainly the end of April, which coincides, obviously, with the Zoning and Progress Doctrine. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our, uh, our, our consulting team, our very learned consulting team of uh, Jared Snyder, and I think we have online Philip DiMaria, uh, who will also be joining. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to them, and they'll go through a short presentation, and we'll be happy to answer any questions you might have after that. Good morning, Jared Schneider. Happy to be here today, and thank you for the flexibility. Um, Philip is at home sick. That's what we are all dealing with lately today, so um, really appreciate your flexibility. Um, so really good overview. We're going to give you a recap of, real, real quickly, I think we all know what the overlay is about, but really focus on those components of the overlay draft. Um, so again, as we talked about, this is just really in, in draft format. We're going to present some of the components and mechanics because that hasn't you all have not seen that at this point. And then we're gonna give you a, kind of an overview of what we heard in the October, late October meeting with the public, and as George said, where, where we're going with the future um, outreach. So again, just trying to get a, a temperature check today on, on where we're headed with the components of the overlay as we fine tune it over the next few months. <clears throat> so you all have seen this, this map. This is the study limits. Um, really, again, what we're trying to address are the, you know, the downtown multifamily, the homes that are multifamily homes, the larger homes, um, as well as kind of the proposed development that's occurred over time. So as Jennifer mentioned, the, the original ordinance was just south of downtown or overlay, and it extended now extends to Union Street on the south there. We've all heard it, the concern of, of future development. We just talked about it in the, the previous ses um, agenda item. Uh, and then really what we're doing here is developing a character overlay that starts to talk about building design, compatibility concerns, and different architectural styles. What, you know, what is an overlay? Again, this, this sits on top of the base zoning, and it just pro provides additional rules um, that, for development, and it looks at neighborhood design compatibility specifically. What we're not talking about here is removing the base zoning or changing the base zoning um, or the entitlements, and, and it's really not... The thing we like to say, it's not a, a panacea or a silver, silver bullet. It's really just trying to get at the character and, and fitting in with what we're looking for. And this all really overlaps with the compatibility component in the comprehensive plan. That's what we're trying to, to institute. It's, it's looking at compatibility and preserving neighborhood character. And this is something the city staff's been working on for, for quite some time. 
So I'm going to have Phil now. He's going to walk through really uh, four or five slides that are that are higher level, the components of the overlay, and we're going to talk about kind of the issues that we're trying to address and and how we've addressed them with this overlay. Philip, can you hear us? Okay. Yes, I can. Thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you, Jared. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Okay, great. And and I'll just reiterate my um, gratitude for allowing me to attend. Um, via Zoom. I, I appreciate the flexibility uh, personally. Um, so uh, what, we're, what we're talking about and really getting into some of the nuts and bolts of, of what we've drafted as a potential overlay district for the South Douglas area. Um, and we've taken a three-pronged sort of approach when looking at compatibility. Um, so the first real new concept or mechanics, as Jared said, is this concept of a daylight plane. Um, it's used in, in several other areas uh, in the region in different sort of forms and approaches. Um, you all are, are familiar with the concept of a step back. That's something that we see pretty, um, pretty it's pretty popular in Pinellas County. Um, but this sort of approach of a daylight plane is used um, along the West Coast, on the East Coast of Florida, and uh, what what we found and why uh, we're proposing to use it in this specific area is because it's flexible. Um, this chart on the right side seems pretty technical, um, but really what it's doing is uh, providing a relationship between lot width, um, which is sort of the, the, the front of the lot as it faces the right of way, um, and a specific angle of daylight plane. And the idea is that used as a sliding scale, the wider the lot gets, the flatter the daylight plane um, and the angle of the daylight plane. And in, a, in an area like South Douglas, this is what we felt was a good solution to uh, address the different lot sizes and lot types, especially on uh, the west side of Douglas versus the east side of Douglas, and allowing for some level of flexibility um, between those differing lot sizes and lot types while still addressing the overall goal of compatibility, minimizing bulk um, and, and large homes, these sort of uh, uh, redevelopments that are occurring where consolidation of lots is an issue um, and really changing the character of the neighborhood. So just some rationale as to why um, this sliding scale of daylight plane is being used rather than a traditional step back approach or a step back approach that you might be familiar with in your form based code areas or um, what is used in other areas of Pinellas County like Palm Harbor or um, the city of St. Pete, St. Petersburg. Um, locally, just to give you some examples of where this approach is used, the uh, city of Sarasota employs this along some of their uh, corridors where they feel like compatibility is something that really needs to be addressed. And then the town of Longboat Key, um, also in Sarasota County, and Manatee County, uses a similar sliding scale um, as an approach as they've seen redevelopment occur um, in a similar manner where multiple lots are consolidated, large homes are built, and the character of the area sort of changes as well. The added effect that this has is um, also addressing uh, finished floor elevation and minimal, minimum habitable floor elevation. Um, and this allows there to be uh, some guidance and some flexibility as uh, we address sort of issues uh, associated with sea level rise and uh, higher and higher minimum floor elevations. Um, so that's the, the first concept. Um, the second concept that is being proposed in the current draft of the ordinance uh, before you today is uh, the idea of regulating building design and building orientation. So there are three sort of goals that are included in the draft, or, um, draft ordinance. Um, the first is uh, requiring the front of buildings to face the primary street and including a front door as a primary entrance. A garage placement is something that, that is discussed and regulated. Um, and then the use of fill um, in some of the lots as well. And so the, the idea there is that we're providing some guidance so that this traditional neighborhood feel that people love in this area of Dunedin um, is reinforced through some sort of regulatory structure 
um, and, and without being too specific and or uh, prescriptive. Um, the third thing uh, or the third prong of this of this three pronged approach has to do with architectural style. Um, the city, you all have done such a wonderful job of adopting uh, the Cooper Johnson sort of architectural handbook over the years. Um, it's a really excellent tool and inventory of the sorts of styles that would be um, compatible and uh, sort of pay homage to this, the sorts of uh, architecture that is prevalent within the city. Um, and so what we've what we've suggested in this ordinance is that we should use that lean on it um, in some ways as a way of um, allowing for there to be continuity and uh, uh, a prescriptive use of architecture throughout the district, sort of reinforcing its historical character, its co cohesiveness as a neighborhood. Um, and then we added one prevalent architectural style that is not included with the Cooper Johnson handbook. And that is uh, the, the prevalence of mid-century ranch um, architecture in this area. Um, so we felt like it was important, especially as we sort of build a case um, for why uh, this district is special um, and why it has such value and there's rationale for these uh, increased regulations within character overlay is really recognizing the existing structures and types that um, provide and uh, contribute to the overall character of this overlay district. Um, so that's, that's an overview of this sort of three-pronged approach included within the overlay district. Um, if you just, if you were to crack open the ordinance, you would also see um, some regulatory language that, that establishes character overlays as a as a general sort of district type within um, the city of Dunedin's regulatory framework. Um, so we've discussed that at length at previous hearings. Maybe uh, some of you remember this, but uh, just a brief overview would be that you know in order to set yourself up for success for this overlay district to exist, you need to have an implementing. Um, sort of regulatory framework, and th this provides um, that that regulatory framework. Um, so with that, I, I think I covered, and I know I spent some time kind of reviewing um, the nuts and bolts of this. Uh, Jared, I'll kick it back to you if there's anything you'd like to speak to specifically. Um, we spent a good amount of time uh, reviewing other ordinances and other uh, other municipalities and struggles that they're having, similar struggles that Dunedin has. I think it was mentioned in the previous agenda topic that a lot of municipalities and jurisdictions are facing similar struggles um, and really just looking for best practices. And we feel like this is a, a really great example of, of dealing with uh, redevelopment and maintaining the character of these historic neighborhoods. Thank you very much. Thanks, Philip. No, I think you covered it well. I, I think one other component we can get into during the discussion is this concept and, and concern of lot combination. And so we, we can kind of come back to that and how that fits in with, with the daylight plane, but that's definitely something that we heard during the, the public meeting. Um, so what I'll do- And if I can just say, sure. that's not included in this. We have, we, it's not per se talked about in right. this, and but so, well, why? Right. Correct. Um, so what we have is we've talked about it a little bit here on this slide in, in front of you on the, the daylight plane itself and the lot combination. It's still something that we're, we're discussing internally and working through and, and talking with other uh, municipalities as well. But Philip, do you want to elaborate a little bit on some of the research that we've been doing on that? Sure, sure, absolutely. Thank you, Jared. Yeah, it, it, it's a complex topic. A lot of it comes down to what uh, authority um, or or really the process of lot consolidation. Um, so typically when, when, uh, when a lot split occurs, an application goes in front of city staff to review for all zoning requirements. When lot consolidation occurs, it really operates at just the property appraiser level in the form of a boundary adjustment. Um, so there's little review process because it's just seen as a, as a boundary adjustment process. What we've discussed internally, and we're, we're still considering 
um, and really reviewing sort of the literature that's out there is seeing if there's an opportunity to use some sort of special permit process, whether that's a quasi-judicial process or a legislative process is something that we still need to, to discuss um, at, for either lots over a certain size or homes over a certain size. Um, so those are two options that we're considering, but we need to fully understand the legal ramifications of that. We look forward to, to discussing that a little bit further as well. Hopefully that sheds some light on that specific issue. Um, I also was really interested in your discussion that, you know, some of the, the lots are naturally smaller in older mm -hmm. districts. And to me, that's not a bad thing because what's wrong with the row house? I mean, some of the historic areas now in Tampa uh, are the old row houses and they're charming. And so, uh, you know, I, I don't see that there's an issue with the smaller lots. Again, I think it's, as you said, that there's no special permit process when you begin co-joining lots and building over the boundary. Doesn't come back to you be until it's yeah already been combined. Yeah. So yeah, so there's no oversight there, and that's how we end up, in my opinion, with the McMansions. With the McMansions, and again, you know that West Main, uh, in Tampa, that's going to be probably the next historic district. Those are charming little uh, row houses. That's the old historic Hispanic district. And it's abutting right now, um, what's or right around the armature, what's that district called? Oh, Tampa Heights area. Tampa Heights. Yeah. It's right abutting. And everybody mm -hmm. says, you know, that next area will be the new historic. Mm -hmm. Exactly what we're talking about, using the lot size, and they're charming. Yeah, that's a great example that you bring up, the Heights area. And then, obviously, I mean, we're seeing it all over the country, the, these same traditional neighborhoods with row homes and those are some of the comments we heard where there's 1,200 square foot ranch homes. I, another example is downtown uh, Old Northeast in St. Pete where you see a row or a block of these 1,200 square foot homes that are now two-story and, and you know, they're, they're more massive. But I, I think what Philip was getting at with those step backs and the daylight plane, you still may get that, the two-story homes that come in, but it's not, not necessarily overpowering either. Um, and they don't have the three to five stories, obviously, that we have in the, the underlying zoning here. So you're going to come back. The idea is, I mean, we can't solve it today, but you're going to come back right. with suggestions. You haven't forgotten that because that wasn't in the documentation. It was mentioned on your slide, but it yeah. wasn't anywhere in the documentation that you that's, gave us. That's correct. We're still working through that. And, and obviously, like Philip said, sure. what are the from the development development right we want to be careful on that too okay. you know i have one more thing that i would really like for you all to take a look at and that's breckenridge and they have been doing because if you look down at our downtown and we've already had some of these questions where you have the one story the old bricks and you know the old uh 1920 1910 in breckenridge they came up with some formula that they allowed, you know, to build over these, you know, old historic areas, uh, you know, one single buildings, but they did it in a specific way. And it's supposed to be, you know, I would just like you all to take a look at that because it's, that's eventually, I've already heard that, that some of these one story downtown, eventually they're gonna want to go up vertical. And we need to have a really good grasp on how other um, historic areas have handled that. And Breckenridge is supposed to have done a beautiful job. Thanks, Commissioner Kynes. Yeah, that's, yeah. If, I, if I may. Oh, I'm so, so ahead, sorry. Phil. Go ahead. Go for it, Philip. Oh, okay, great. Um, it, it's funny that you, you mentioned Breckenridge, and we'll definitely crack open that book of code. Uh, I really appreciate that comment. One of the, interestingly enough, one of the, um, codes that we looked at was Aspen, and I, I believe they probably use a similar, Aspen, Colorado, and they use a similar uh, approach to um, measuring their development rights. 
it's called a cubic content ratio. And without getting too technical, it's probably, it sounds very similar to what you mentioned in Breckenridge. So that wouldn't surprise me, but we'll double check on that. I appreciate that comment. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that cubic, that. It's, it's kind of the massing and the total amount of mass is what, where Philip's going. Okay. Um, any comments on the, the double lot thing? Since we brought it up, I want to let the gentleman finish his presentation, but I don't want to cut anybody else off. No, I mean, I, I, I feel the same way. I feel that, you know, the, the lot thing seems to potentially cure a lot of things. And so, um, yeah, I'll be anxious to see what you guys have because I think it's pretty important to have it part of this. I, I agree. I, I think what we're talking about, we're talking about that issue of, of the big houses um, and that because there's a double lot now, and that's the massing you're talking about, and, you're, and we're working on attempting to have the massing be appropriate for what is currently there. Is that, is that? Exactly. Do I got that? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Let me, let me ask one question on that. If somebody's already built <clears throat> on a double lot, this wouldn't affect them. It's just that you don't get to move beyond the boundaries of your lot, or, you, or you're built on double lot, then you'd be required to be on a single lot, or is that part of what you're? We're, we're looking at any future development. So if you have, yeah, not if you already have the two lots and you're, you've built on them. Yeah, you've got that. That's yeah. No, because I mean I know people that have that, and you you wouldn't want to take it away. But again, you're right. trying to avoid this collecting more lots and building the big, you know. And that mansion. is something that we heard quite a bit on from the, the meeting in October. Is, is folks were really keenly interested in from an addition or. So getting into that process a little bit further and diving into that as far as if I want to renovate my home, what does that look like? Right. Okay, good. Anything from you on the double lot thing, Joe? Uh, no, that was actually one of my primary issues with the whole overlay. Right. I was trying to solve that problem. That. I guess one of the questions I have in that regard is that right now if you're able to build on a double lot, is that now one lot? Can I sell... If it's lot A and lot B, can I sell lot B after my house is built? Well, it depends on or whether or not it's still a buildable lot that could be subdivided, but I think that's one of the gaps that sometimes is presented when you have an automatic system that doesn't speak to what happens after you've combined the lots to build. Essentially what you're doing is building over lot lines and setbacks, and you're recognizing you know, a larger footprint, but then to your point, if that person ever wants to sell their home, and uh, move on or someone wants to tear it down and redevelop then the, then that could be a gap in most codes where that that's not really addressed how um, whether if you if you combine them for that purpose whether now they need to stay combined um, versus being able to continue to avail yourself of underlying lots of record which may or may not be conforming underlying lots of record meaning conforming to your current minimum lot sizes and and things like that and is that, is that something that could be addressed with what we're doing now, or is that a separate issue that we would have to deal with? Well, I'll look at your consultants, but from my perspective, they're you related. Have to do it all at once. Yeah, I think we're looking at specifically at lot combinations, but certainly, uh, you know, for lot splits, we, we have a process, as Jared mentioned, that already kind of allows us to analyze that internally. Mm -hmm. On the split side, though, I don't think we're as concerned, right? Because we're getting smaller lots. We're going to get, be getting smaller houses on each of those lots. It's I think the focus. However, right. in theory, you're correct. But, but if you think about it, because you know my my brother-in-law does this all the time. You know, might buy a big lot and subdivide it. But if someone has already done that, let's just say, and they've built their home under the old codes or old whatever existing, so they've maxed out right that lot. When they go to sell this other smaller lot that uh, let's say they didn't combine it you know they they were doing it to make money to help them build this house well now you've got new codes that you might actually make it almost unbuildable because they've maxed out their lot and the new guy comes in and has to follow the light plane or whatever you're calling it you see what i'm saying so there has Something has, to, I don't know what, but you've so got to address it. Yeah, I would say our subdivision plat review would cover that because we're going to make sure that we've got, you're going to, we're going to make sure we have minimum lot dimensions. We're going to have to make sure we have minimum lot widths and setbacks. And then for something that comes after this, we'd be looking at that daylight plane as part of that review process. Sure. Okay. 
Okay, uh, let's finish up your presentation. Sure. Sorry about that. No, perfect, good discussion. I uh, really just wanted to give you a kind of an overview and synopsis of what we heard. We had a stakeholder meeting in early October and a public meeting, like we said, in late October. So going into the, the stakeholder meeting, we had a, a really good group of several advisory committees that we, we all had kind of come together during the same meeting. So here's a, a listing of who was there. And some of the things that we got into, you know, really we got into some of the sim similar concepts before we had really had them fully drafted out. And we heard Edgewater Drive as a major concern, um, <laughs> preserving the scenic views. The, the, an interesting thing, thing that came up were these corner lots. And this came up in the, in the public meeting too, how to address corner lots, um, allowing more windows. And, and just generally, uh, folks were not happy with the way those have been built over the past, the newer ones. Um, we talked about this a little bit, the renovation thresholds of how far are you going to go? Is it if I want to do a carport, if I want to do an extension, what's the process, having a clear process? Um, generally, the daylight planes were, were well liked, and there were several architects that were there um, that had used it or, or applied it in different areas as well. So now we're going we're gonna to hop into the actual um, public meeting that we had. And I, I got to say, I know you guys talked about this in the past. That was really well attended. I think we had around 100 show up. So that was, that was fantastic. We've had other meetings with, with COVID where you just don't know right now. Um, so really great discussion. Again, again, some of the similar themes, addressing larger homes. Edgewater came up again. Some folks talked about the larger lots there versus um, the smaller 50-foot wide lots and the, the differential there. So that's where... We're talking about that daylight plane and, and how do you calibrate that for different areas. Um, preserving the character again. Um, some felt uh, it's a good middle ground. And, and similar to the last agenda item, a lot of people have mentioned that they were happy that the city was looking at this. So kudos to you all. Uh, height, again, we've heard that. Losing the neighborhood charm, parking, all the same themes. So this is just kind of a general overview of what we heard. And we had handouts as well, and so we've kind of boiled it up into uh, these themes. The next theme that came up that we already hit a little bit is the process. So some folks really mentioned they wanted to understand and have a well-defined process. Again, that gets into the renovations, like when, it, when am I going to be impacted, the lot splits. Um, there was a mixed feeling on, on multifamily. Uh, some, again, felt they own homes or they own property that's in the MF-15, so they still like to have that ability to develop multifamily. Um, there's a desire for more information on, on that actual existing overlay itself, so that's something that we'll be working on, obviously, over the next few months. Um, main concerns, compatibility, character, how will compatibility be reviewed? So again, that, that gets into the transparency and clarity. Um, need for enforcement, not allowing uh, variances. A lot of number of folks mentioned that variances occur, and, and to get around the compatibility today, that's what's happening, or was in the past. And then going straight into the daylight plane. So we, we brought this concept up, and some mentioned that they'd prefer um, an impervious surface or open land percentage. That's something that a lot of municipalities do, um, and, and Philip did a good job kind of explaining that. And that got into, you know, is it too complex and, and trying to understand that. Um, request for more information on the side or the setbacks for corner lots. Again, that was something corner lots kept coming up over and over again. Um, Non-compliant structures was mentioned and, and how to <coughs> address those moving forward. Um, other concerns, we talked about this a little bit, and this gets into the massing. Do you limit square footage? Um, I know St. Pete gets into FAR-based approach or um, similar concepts there, so it's getting into that mass. And then there was this interesting point about is it scalable? Several folks mentioned would you take this character overlay into different parts of the city? So Philip talked about how uh, there's a process where you could do that over time if that was the desire of the commission. Um, others mentioned the the concern or the impact of trees for the daylight plane, so that came up. To get into that, to another component of that, that three-pronged approach that Phil mentioned, the building or architectural style. So there's a lot of discussion on this. Um, some liked the traditional home style, um, and others mentioned they want more flexibility. So we laid out those five types in the mid-century. Others said, well, I'd, I'd like more flexibility. 
Um, and there is also others on the flip side that dislike the modern styles that you see um, that are happening. Uh, how does this apply to ADUs? That came up quite a bit. And then general concerns, some don't like, you know, we don't like added restrictions, right? And we want to keep it transparent and simple. So some mentioned that as a concern. Um, and some mentioned the, the focus on the size and character of the homes as, as actually a concern. Uh, again, that gets into that flexibility. They want to have as much flexibility as possible. Actually, let me, let me hit on that last bullet. So just like older homes torn down um, and then you know, really what, what we're hearing there is, is some did mention that um, there's, a, there's a concept, again, of the mid-century homes being built in a prior time, so having that flexibility to allow more modern homes that fit the needs of today. So um, we hit on this. George talked about this. What we're doing is really fine-tuning these concepts over the next few months. We've got another public workshop coming up in two weeks. So that'll be a really good chance to kind of hash through this a little bit further and then looking at LPA and commission in, in April or commission. That meeting in February, it's the 15th, not the 14th, correct? That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. It's the 15th? Yes. It's the We're 15th. not doing it on Valentine. Hell really? no. <laughs> we <laughs> were talking about it. <laughs> I got to work on an F holiday. <laughs> yeah. Thought it's that wasn't a good idea. It's actually the 15th. We have to work on it. It's the 15th, holiday. which is a Tuesday. Okay. Then we need to get that out to people quickly. Yeah, what time is it at? Like a 6.30 or a... Uh, <coughs> I believe it's 5.30. Don't quote me on that. 5.30? That's, that's not a good time. I want to say 6 to 7.30. 7. Yeah, that's yeah, better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we think it would all be We've there. already reached out to Sue and we're, we're going to Yeah, because I was going to say 5.30, some people are just getting off of work. And is that the library again? No, this time it will be at the Hale Center. Okay. we got a little bigger space. We okay, good. are predicting we're the, another good space. That's smart. That's smart. Okay, uh, again, I'm gonna go back to you, Jennifer. Redefine what you are looking for us today. So we were just uh, uh, looking to give you the information regarding exactly where we are right now. You wanted to remain informed okay. on where we are and next steps. All right, so um, I'm gonna open it up for questions or any dialogue or comments that anybody has. Mm -hmm. And then I'm gonna let uh, the public speak. And I need to apologize because I we had our survey conversation I totally forgot to let the public speak I don't think there was anybody here but if they want to come up and tell us something about that too that's okay all right so I'm gonna start with you vice mayor any any other questions or comments that you have after this update <clears throat> yes um, this is my comment and I've been thinking about this a lot and you know and many of us were here Bo you were here you were here uh, you know, most, maybe most of you, you were here. The 70s, th that's really when they got into the, we've got to do something to reconstruct a downtown. We've got this dead, you know, the tumbleweed downtown. Okay, so they did all that with the thought that it was going to be very urban. And all these years later, almost, what, 50 years later, the, the idea that we have from our residents is that they want to preserve those neighborhoods and areas that have the historic character. So what <clears throat> happened is that the zoning is totally screwed up because the zoning should go it for higher far. in the middle and then it should dip down as you hit these historic neighborhoods and areas. So our zoning is askew. And with all, you know, I, I'm saying they, they did bring downtown to life. And that was a tremendous effort. And I'm not, you know, I'm, but, you know, then as you look at something 50 years later and how your thoughts and concerns have changed and your zoning is just not right. Our zoning has not kept up with the real feeling of our town and what people want the real feeling of our town to be. That is the, that is the issue. Now, you've been very fair to say this is not the whole panacea. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking at it as this is really a big first step, but then there's gonna have to be more 
and eventually you're gonna have to correct that zoning, eventually, and look at your codes. And that might be long after I'm gone, but that's gonna be the eye on the ball, is to reintegrate the kind of zoning that people want, you know, that they look for to preserve the charm and the quaintness, it's backwards. Do you have any comments? No, Commissioner Kynes, I totally agree. This is a first step and, and something we've talked about is something you could do in the short term. You know, obviously the rezoning came up in 2019, but this was really just a way to do, to kind of capture the, the sentiment of the character and, and the preservation that you're talking about. But I think I talked to Jennifer and that what you would have to do in two or three years, Jennifer, would be a complete to really look at the zoning in a complete, what'd you, what'd you say, Jennifer? What you would have to do eventually? Right, well, it, and actually, George and I have had discussions about it. It would be a complete review of the Land Development Code with recommendations. It is, you know, the discussions George and I have had, it is very unwieldy. It, it contradicts unwieldy. itself in many areas, and we really need to bring it up to date. <clears throat> and he's choking. <laughs> just discussing it with with happiness. We're going to give that poor guy a chance to get his. That's actually that would be a fun task. It, it, as Jennifer mentioned, it's six hundred. You're here for a year now. Yeah, I just poor thought guy. about it. It's January because you came in January of last year, didn't you? You are correct. Yes, he did. Oh my correct. God! Thank and you. we're already talking about a complete redo of the land code. Commissioner Kaiser, I think you said it well. A lot of cities are dealing with this. Things have changed over the last fifty years, and we haven't kept up and trying to keep it. Um, flexible. I mean, life stages and people are changing, and COVID's changed that. So this is not unique here. It's it's happening all over the place. Yeah. But I, I think what I'm sort of throwing out there, and because again, I'm going to be here ten more months, whatever. But I want to get it in that your strategic plan that you're going to be looking at this, and that you're going to eventually. That's how you're going to have to. Not to say that these overlay, it's not going to be a good thing, but the bottom line is you're going to have to look at that zoning that has not kept up. Well, one of the things, if I may, Mayor, that George and I have discussed is a step one in the business plan for uh, as, as we budget for 2023. Yes. So, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll just add to that, Commissioner or Vice Mayor. Um, you know, we did, as you mentioned, in 2019, start to look at the zoning, and we were trying to meet with different streets and you know you kind of want to do it in a in a group right and we did find people that were willing to do that I think we need to keep up with that process as arduous as it was and let those people the ones that want to change change as long as it's you, have you know whatever I mean get what you can get is my point before before we go and do the you know, but that's that's for another day. I'm just saying, you know, they, there were people that were willing, and we should let them change voluntarily, because they may sell their property or something, and then the the new person's not going to be willing. So, I mean, I do think we need to continue with that process, and I, I'm thinking that that can be done prior to any big, huge land code review. But that's just my opinion. Okay, you good? Oh, yes, I've said my piece. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Gavin. Uh Everything the Vice Mayor said. <laughs> uh, thank you for making it so easy on me. Uh, the only thing that I, I think we talked about what was going on in the 70s and, and now look at us changing, and I think that's part of actually our, our job is to, to try and take a look and look at trends and look at our city and to see how does Dunedin look 30 years from now, 50 years from now. And when you see changes in trends or whatever, to be able to... Uh, you, you know, when I was in business, you know, your long-term plan, if you're here and you want to look here, but you see your long-term plan changing, the faster you can make corrections, the less violent those corrections are. Yeah. And so we don't go from building heights of 15 stories down to two stories, and I know we weren't there, but just trying to show the extreme. But if we're always looking 30 to 50 years ahead, then any changes in that code are, are, are a little less volatile mm -hmm. and, 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 and painful, right? They're, they're a little shorter. And I know that means just a lot more work for the staff. They've got to look at them more frequently and things of that nature. But I think you were on point to, to make sure that our zoning is correct, our lane codes are correct. And, and if we're only waiting every 30 to 50 years, then I think those, any adjustments we make are, are, are a little harder, 
So, but well done. So thank you. Thank so, you, Commissioner. Um, yeah, back in the seventies. Uh, you know, it was only 2005. We used to be able to have eight stories in our downtown. So, right. well, and of course, we dealt with that. And Commissioner Kynes was on that. And uh, um, but you know, we, we know the surrounding area is 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 kind of tainted that way as well. Um, you know, and that's and obviously that's complicated. But um, but it's really really important because it really is about what we're going to look like as we move forward. Um, you know, I, I know everybody sitting up here shares what the citizens share. Like we see things and we're like, oh my gosh, that's not what we want to look like. Um, you know, one thing that I'm going to say this while I remember it, um, when you talk about scalable, I've seen a couple, two now, in uh, the San Mateo area over by Hammock that starts to make my head spin a little bit. So I worry about that, that you know, there may be some other areas in the city that we do not want to go certain ways with huge, huge houses that don't fit. Um, so, um, you know, the, the biggest issue that I heard, I missed the community session, and um, so I didn't get the flair of that, so I appreciate the update here. Um, but, I, but some of my feedback is, like, is this really going to work? I mean, like, there's all these issues, but is this just a lot of much to do about it, and it's not really going to do it? Um, so, um, you know, my notes as I read through your, your, your information was, you know, the daylight plane, I, you know, I wanted to get out my old protractor and, you know, I, I, it was, I, I found it, um, I, I get it, kind of, but it's, it's kind of out there. And so one thing as we move forward that would be really helpful to me, not just with daylight plane, but the single versus multiple lots, like what's the real life view? Okay, we know we've got some situations out there. We know we denied one just before we started all this. What's that look like? Okay, so visual what's it look? Examples. Yeah, what's it look like today, examples. and what could they actually do under this? So, like, what's the real difference? And some things that we look at and we said, "Oh my gosh, that's a monstrosity." What? How would that have changed under this? So we yeah. can actually start to see and understand, and people can see the real difference it makes. Um, if I may, I, spot on, and, and we're actually talking about that too. We're going to include that with the the meeting coming in, in February. That's great. And we skipped over it, but it. This is in Dunedin, but we wanted to kind of show similar examples to Dunedin, and we'll lay out kind of what that looks like or concept. So I just wanted you to be. Yeah, if you can show us that. Dunedin examples, what it was and what it could be, good. Yeah. versus be what it is or something. Right. You know that it get probably Google be a Google sensitive. Maps is your friend. You yeah. can go back yeah. and see what it you know. Exactly. But it would really about. help to try to you know like. So we see how much of a change sure, sure. it really is. And I don't think it's, I think you're right. It's not the end all to answer everything. No, it's but, a but you know, it is a step and how much step. of a step is, is the question. And it's an important step. And we need to see that visually. And with, and with the lot control too, I mean, it may make it, you know, the lot thing could make a huge part of the difference with the daylight plane, you know, but again, and when you make the comment about um, the impact on trees with the daylight plane, can you explain that sure, to me? Those were a couple of specific comments. As I recall, it was in the Edgewater area. There's some specific lots the that trees. had pretty good tree coverage. So they were concerned that if someone was going to redevelop that you could impact the trees and gotcha. you know, it's um, you know, that's my real life thing. Really, it's like, is it going to work? Is it going to do it? So I think really, when you look at the daylight plane, you look at the couple other things, the, you know, the location areas, the, you know, the architectural style, I obviously understand. But I think in terms of, of the rest of it with the single multiple lot size is just, again, here's what we have. Here's, here's what could happen. Here's what has happened even and what, what would happen under this new thing. And I, I think those are my biggest things. But um, yeah, this is this is important, and thanks for the work. Thank you, Commissioner Tornga. Thank you. I like what's been said, um, so I don't have to repeat all of that. Uh, I can summarize it by stating that in my conversation with the with the city manager um, for the agenda review about this was how does this really then work? I mean, how, who who really determines this? How do they really determine this? Um, what does this do? And I'm 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 actually looking at that data. <laughs> The daylight issue. Um, how how does that really how does that work and how does that help? Um, but I, in my opinion, what we we're attempting to do here, and we were grasping the the most immediate way um, to resolve uh, this concept about compatibility in in that area. 
And this was deemed, I think, uh, Jennifer, to be the, the most efficient way to do that at that point in time. So I agree with what's been set up here, but what are we doing? So what are we doing now? This is what we're asking, I guess, to have brought to us. And I appreciate the concerns about the this the protractor. She's she's, <laughs> she's a mathematician. Well, I just got done saying I was good at math, but I wouldn't have attempted that. <laughs> okay, that was beyond my scope. So so I'm looking. So as I so as I'm driving through there now, looking and asking, how, how does this really kind of work? And then my comment that has always been to the city manager is this. Uh, can we can we take this to other areas within the city and how does this how does this work? Um, because if it works in other parts of the cities, well, I, but then we'd have to look at it. And I appreciate what you're saying. That you're going to give us examples and, and show us really how this works. I also appreciate your comment, but I want to ask you if you think I'm on the right street here because I, want, I don't want to be going down the wrong road. Um, is that we did have architects there, and they were understanding of what was being attempted here with the, with this concept for compatibility. Um, of creating that daylight thing, but of course the lot the lots have to be thrown in there as well. Is is that sort of correct? I mean, that's, this was our this was our the, the the sliding the sliding bar rolling past us, and we grabbed a hold of it, and we're swinging with it. But next yeah, steps are bigger. That's a fair assessment. Yes, they they okay. were supportive of it, and obviously we've talked about it here. We we don't want to make it overly complicated. We want to make sure it works. So that's. That's what our job is over the next month, few months to calibrate it and make sure you know, it's meeting the intent. And then as Commissioner Kynes says, there's next steps are, are much futuristic and, and, and a good hard look and all good points. So thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, can I say one thing? I was always good at geometry. <laughs> that was the only Love thing it. I was good at. I did it. I passed. I wouldn't say I liked it or was good at it. Because <laughs> that's the daylight plane. Um, <laughs> So a couple of things. Um, I knew it was mentioned under the comments, but as we know, <clears throat> every time somebody does a remodel, especially in addition, okay, and especially in this area, it's not, I'm not saying it doesn't happen in other areas, but this, our little map that we have, parking is always the issue. And when I went through your written document so far, I did just, why don't you just tell me how you're going to address the parking issue because, you know, in some areas it's worse because the roads are more narrow. They were built, you know, under a different code because it was a long time ago. And in some areas it's not. But parking has been an issue. And when we've approved things like, you know, the McMansion, the couple of the McMansions that we've seen, there's been no additional required parking. You know, it's one per bedroom. Well, you could have these giant bedrooms. I mean, I'm just saying, how are we going to deal with that? Because we have neighborhood, after, not neighborhood, street after street after street in this mapped area that complains heavily about the existing parking situation with single garages, single driveways, with street parking and, uh, you know, all of that. So how, how are, are you going to address this in this document? Yes, it's definitely something we're, we're going to. We're not quite to that level yet, but I'm going to turn it. But you will. Yes, and, and Philip, I know we've talked quite a bit about it. Do you want to expand a little bit on where we're at on that? Yeah, yeah sure. It, it's something that, I mean, parking ratios are something that we initially, I don't want to call say audited, but it's something that we initially thought of when looking to potentially being a little bit more strict with how we deal with specifically multifamily housing. Okay. Um, the only the only thing um, within the current ordinance that you, you, know, you sort of see before you today, just in that really like high level draft format, is that we have required additional setbacks for garages, which we think could at least solve some of the issues that you're seeing with single family homes, where maybe the, the lots are a little too shallow, or maybe as you mentioned, um, there isn't enough room on the lot or in front of the garage to allow for additional uh, parking to exist on, on the lot itself and off the street. Um, so that is a design um, item that we, we have addressed in this current ordinance. But I think you're touching on an important part, which is, you know, from a ratio perspective or from a different 
uh, sort of implementation perspective, how can we address those parking concerns that are that are both existing and, and will continue to be prevalent in the future? Well, and I, I, I would say, and again, this is not my area of expertise, so I'm not trying to get in the weeds, but, you know, there, there's all these, if this happens, we need to do that, if this happens, all right. So we don't know yet at this point whether we can eliminate this idea of building across lot lines. We're not sure yet. That's a, it's a legal thing. It's property right. I know that. Y'all are working on it and trying to figure that out. But let's say that's not a thing that we can do. So we have to utilize these other things. You could have had two two-bedroom homes there that they knocked down, right? And, and now you're going to have one giant five- or six-bedroom. Or you're going to have one giant four-bedroom and I know we do it by bedroom, I think, as our parking. I don't remember. But I think square footage of the home has to be considered. That because, be because you can use a little office for a bed. You can use, I, I'm just saying. And I have a drive, a, a two-car garage driveway, or two-car garage and a two-car driveway. Now, my garage, you could put a car in there if you wanted to. Um, because my husband's in construction, so he has to store everything in there. Well, but we have a very long driveway, and we have three cars. You know, I've got my husband, myself, and my son. What we have to do in order to not be behind each other every time somebody wants to leave, it causes a lot of stress. So a lot of times, one of us parks in the street. Now, that's happening everywhere, because if you got an adult kid, I'm sure everybody's going through the same thing, and I have a two-car driveway. So I think we have to think about that when we're doing it. So I, again, I'm not telling you how to solve it. I'm just saying it needs to be addressed, because we can't go address what's happening with parking on these smaller streets and say everybody has to park on one side, and then not address the new development that's just going to cause a further problem. So. I'm just saying. So that's right. important to, to me. I think it's probably important to everybody, I'm sure, right? Sure. Okay. Um, Mayor, if yes, I may, I just want to clarify. You said that, that, just make sure that we have the expectations correct. You said that we were looking at, at prohibiting um, crossing lot lines. We're looking at a combination of lots. Yeah, Is how it? do we do it? Yeah. Right, okay. Because right. they're two different things. So. I mean... You buy two lots and then you build right. one big McMansion is what we're trying to af avoid. Right. Correct. So, but I'm just saying we've got to look at the parking standards mm -hmm. for whatever that is. Um, I know um, one of the things, you know, that was mentioned some time ago was, and I'm not trying to mix the two issues and send us down a rabbit hole, but it was the whole historic district thing, okay? And I'm going to say something because I assume it's true, but tell me if it isn't. Once we complete this, right, because you bring it back, we approve it, we still, it probably is going to be this summer before it actually gets on the books, right? We're February now. April. April for passage? Mm -hmm. Yes. Because when are the you moratorium, coming back to us? The, the zoning in progress sunsets on April 30th. Yeah. Okay, April 30th. Okay, right. so May 1st. All right, well, I wasn't too far. Mm -hmm. Okay, so would it be then at that point we would start to look at where, because the historic district in certain areas is an additional protection, correct? For redevelopment purposes, because you're going through that certificate of appropriateness process. Okay. For sure. Are you wanting to wait before we attack, tackle that to see if this works? Or are you, I mean, is there, is there any need to do that? Or, and again, I know we're all thinking we've got strategic planning, we've got business plan initiatives, we're trying to prioritize, and I'm just trying to, I got experts sitting in front of me, so I'm trying to determine. No, I mean, my personal feeling, Mayor, is I think if you're comfortable with the language as, as it's presented to, to us, it becomes another dimensional standard, if you will. So what it'll be like is, so we'll be looking at when, when a house comes in and wants to do a building permit on a lot, we're going to look at, do you meet your rear yard setback? Do you meet your side yard setbacks? This is an additional dimensional standard. We'll, we'll ask the question, do you meet your, your, your light plane 
uh, index. Right. So for for me, I don't think the two necessarily need Intercept. to come together. Right. But but certainly, it would. we're going to continue to look at that same home from the historic perspective. Is it registered? Uh, does right. it have historic significance? If it does, do we need to talk to the HPAC? That kind of thing. Okay, so the reason I asked this is because I did ask Jennifer a question yesterday about tearing houses down, you know, and does this do any protection for that? And the answer was no. And, and you know, would it be even legal to tell somebody they couldn't tear a house down? Well, now we, we do have a provision, just so you know, currently. So if a house comes in and it's deemed to have histor historic significance, we won't issue the demolition permit immediately. We'll do that. Right, but if it work. isn't, that's what I was asking, Correct. if it isn't. Right. So, which just led me to think, okay, so to get to that, you've got to look at the, the whole historic district piece of it. All right, that answers my question. I'm not, I'm not trying to get direction from anybody to go do that. I'm just... I wanted to have those two separate pieces in my own head. Um, but, but can I, can I so, sure. but I, I think maybe her question was, which, which I've asked before, does this overlay preclude that you would have a historic district at some point over in, in a certain area? It doesn't stop that. No, this, this is just, uh, you know, think of it of a, as a layer. So you have, this would be a layer over the base zoning. Mm -hmm. Your historic preservation layer, should it, you know, should a district come, that's, the, that's another and, and layer. And that would be okay, right. eventually. I mean, you know, is that what you were saying? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes. And, it, and because I, was, I had asked the question about, does it stop somebody from, you know, when we were talking about the two lots putting together, does it stop somebody from ripping down those houses? And, and the answer was no. Okay, so you're going to bring back a very clear process for us, right? That's um, I had another question and I've lost it. So I'll open it up to public input while I'm thinking about what my last question was. Anybody wish to come forward and speak to this item? Again, this is an update. We're not making any decisions. It's going back out for public meetings. But you're more than welcome to come up. Come on down, give us your name and address for the record, and you'll, there's a clock up here somewhere, and you'll get three minutes. Uh, my name is Blake Kern. I own the uh, apartments on Broadway at 623. Mm -hmm. And um, just hearing through your guys' conversation, I'm just really concerned about the multifamily, which you guys pointed out before with people comments, and just um, hopefully that the multifamily doesn't, because we're just trying to, add a couple more units to help relieve some of the rents that keep going up. Because I told my renters that if I could just add a little bit more, I can pay the mortgage easily and keep your guys' rents low. And it kind of with some of the stuff out here, like I'm looking at new construction development does not include more than one single unit. I'm kind of getting that, that I would have to rip the whole place down to build one building and make it work. That's what's kind of going on here, and I think there could be some issues with that, especially with the multifamilies, because they just don't want to tear the whole thing down. They just want to maybe make a yeah. little bit more improvements so they can keep everything consistent. And okay. then if I do make a new, then I would have to make it to the new structure style, which would maybe make a little weird because the other buildings look like an older style. I don't know. I think okay. it's a little... All right, let me hear from everybody else. Yeah. Okay, and then we'll have George answer some of that because I think I already know the answer to it, but I don't want to presume because he's the expert, but I want right. to hear from everybody else first, okay? Okay. All right, thank you. thank you. Anybody else wish to come forward and speak? Yep. Come on down. Hi, my name is Lynn Dow. I live at 51 Broadway in Dunedin. Um... I just wanted to make a couple of comments on the presentation that was given. I do believe that the massing and the combining of lots is a separate item from the character overlay. Um, when I bought in Dunedin, I liked the charm and the character of Dunedin. So I really would like to keep the architectural flexibility. Um, I'm not a modern home. I'm not a, a mid-century type person. but I'm all for people doing whatever they want. 
Um, the reason we built our new home is because we have a lot of people coming to town and we need space and a two bedroom, one bath home just doesn't cut it. So we decided to tear down our house and build a new one. We also built or bought another lot that, that is also a two bedroom, one bath. And um, we're planning on tearing that down and building a nice home on that lot as well. My concern is the um, daylight um, plane. That lot is a little bit smaller and we wanna build the same size house on a smaller lot and we will have to go up instead of out. And um, we're trying to figure out how we're gonna do that. And we bought it before all this went into place and it's presenting some issues. Um, uh, let's see, I'm, I'm glad you're having the public discussions. I think it's great. Um, I think the more we talk to the public, the better. And um, I just don't want it to turn into, I came from a development where all the houses were very similar and I just don't want to go back to that. And I like the be to be able to, the freedom to be able to decide what we want to build. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anyone else? Come on up. How's it going? Hi. Welcome. Uh, my name's Josh. Uh, I work with David Weekly Homes. Uh, we built a couple homes in the overlay area that's currently there and have a couple projects going around town. Um, I was just curious from a perspective of the study, uh, as far as the FAR approach, are you guys familiar with how St. Pete does it? Floor area ratio, it's based on lot size and it controls your square footage, which I feel like would be, other than your Mac, you know, your large lots and your double lots and triple, it would fix a lot of your vertical structure of people going really high and maximizing square footage. We run into that because we build in St. Pete and I feel like they do a great job of controlling it we're minimized, I mean, our largest plan is 2,600 square feet. Um, by no means, I don't think that qualifies as a McMansion. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> well, McMansions versus the cottages. Of course. But anyway, uh, go ahead, sorry. Um, and we don't build anything near that size here. I mean, we're 2,000 square feet or lower on just about everything we build. Um, so I was just curious why the FAR approach did not come into play because I guess my concern from a building standpoint, and this, this affects affordability of the home on the, on the back end, and I promise most of the homes that we're taking out are pretty much to the point of being condemned or beyond where it's too much of an investment for an investor to flip. Um, or if they did, there'd be major problems on the back end of it. So I guess my question is with the daylight plane and knowing from a building perspective, we have set plans, we have different elevations, different roof lines. If we have to customize a home to each one because of this daylight plane keeps pitching in the second story or even you know the pitch of the roof, how do you assume you know, affordability on that? Because it's gonna impact it. We can't build a custom home, at least for someone that wants to build a spec home, and we have different elevations, so none of them, you know, they're not gonna look the same. We don't do repeating facade, but how do you do it to where the builder can build an affordable home to where it's not gonna co cost the price of a custom home, I guess. That's the biggest question I have is, because it's a concern, right? We wanna worry about affordable homes on the back end, but also, I mean, we can't, you can't build new homes for very cheap these days. I mean, I think everybody can realize that. Gotcha. Thank you. I'll Thank you. Answer that. Anyone else wish to come forward? Come on, Vinny. Huh. Save the best for last. Hi, Vinny Luisi, Dunedin Museum, also Historic Preservation Commission. I'm kind of looking at two points on it is lot space and uh, this photo kind of gives an idea. You almost see the same example of compatibility, and that's my one issue, uh, on two places. Uh, one is an excellent example is right by Andrews Memorial Chapel on San Mateo Drive. We've got mostly one home, two stories, or maybe one story, and now right near the chapel there's a three-story, which is totally out of place of everything mm -hmm. else. That's and the one you were referring to? It's uh, I just want to stories. use that as a prime example. It's just struts right into Crazy. the air. But I also notice on the south side uh, or the uh, north side across the street from the Blue Jays Stadium on Belt Trees, there's a lot of activities happening there in three or four properties recently. And one of those is, I believe, now a two lot building. And it's, it's using quite a bit of space. And I don't know what the agenda is in the future on that. But that's where it brings me to the future. If you're looking at Douglas for the future, 
there's two areas that I want you to consider. It's not tomorrow, maybe not be in the next day, but it could be in the next two years. Is what was called the Upton Laundries, which is today Bill Douglas's museum. Yeah. That's yeah, a big piece of property, and that's right on a main corner. Yeah, Jennifer and I have talked about and that. And that is going to be some discussion of yeah. how you're going to handle that. Yep. Yeah. And so I want that in mind when all of this is going on in discussion. And finally, for the city, is just a warning on that, that in the future we have a parking lot on the corner of Scotland and Douglas. We're doing something with that. And you have to decide how you're going to handle the way of the look on that one as well. So yeah. that's your compatibility and look on that one as well. It and will be compatible, won't yeah. it, Jennifer? Compatibility on Douglas for that as well. Well, and it, it, may, it may have to be taller than we want it, but it will be, compa it'll be pretty. That's what we will make sure it's pretty. You're just compatibility. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, babe. Appreciate it. Anybody else? Okay. So I'm going to go back to the first gentleman who spoke, and that was the adding new units to an old thing. And can I assume that, that when you had it in there, you're referring to new construction like it's a blank lot, right? You're not referring to additions to. I think he might have been referring to the zoning in progress language. That's kind of a stopgap that we have in place. So that I, I, you know, I don't know for sure, but um, it sounds like he was referring to those if you recall, when we did the zoning in progress, we put in those five criteria to basically right to stop everything. Okay, will you will you meet with this gentleman? We when actually when have. we get done with, will you talk to him again? Yeah, yeah certainly, certainly. And just make sure yep. he's understanding yep. both of you when we get done with this. You don't have to wait Confirm till after the meeting, really, but yeah. yeah. Okay. So and obviously those cr criteria will lift on April. 3rd. Right, right. Okay, because I mean nobody should if you've already got units, if you will, and you want to do what he's trying to do, which seems reasonable, to lower his rents to his current time, and that seems like a good thing, yes. even though use isn't coming into it, you want to allow him. Yeah. You know, we're not trying to stop that. Absolutely not. Okay. And after April 30, that would be a absolute. Okay, good. Go. All right. And then as far as the floor area ratio, please. Yeah, I'll, I'll address it, and then uh, Phil chime in here as well. It, it's a great example. Good comment, too. Uh, Very good comment. I thought it was. Yeah, me too. Yeah, St. Pete looks good. at that, and then they look also kind of max building and then impervious surface ratios as well. So, how you know, how much impervious surface can you have? So it's something that we looked at. I, I think the, the thought of the daylight plane got into kind of the specific setbacks and, again, the, the height issues. So... Um, can we do both? We can look at further. Can we do both, or is that too? I mean, listen, we can ask for the world. I understand. I'm I'm just asking for reasonableness. So I'm just saying, it, it, it can both be considered, or is that too taking it too far? Don't panic over there. I see your face, George. No, no I'm just trying to think of how that would work. I mean, and, and I don't know. Yeah. Philip, do you want to chime in? And, and I like that. Yeah, I'd be I'd be happy to, Jared. Um, yeah, I think it. Sure. Thank you. Um, I think it is it is a good comment. Um, we, you know, when we take a look at the current zoning requirements, we our initial kind of concern had to do with some of the maximum height, right? So an FAR approach doesn't really provide. Address that. And, yep. I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. It it doesn't address the height. Correct, correct, exactly that. So all you're doing is sort of putting a measurement on floor area. Um, and then, you know, sort of, it doesn't directly answer the question, but th that's sort of why we took this daylight plane approach and, and why that was preferred over the FAR approach. If there's interest in including a maximum FAR, we'd be happily, happy to include that as well. Um, but we felt like the daylight plane was probably the most predictable in terms of what the actual finished built product would look like. And then I do want to just make a, a quick comment, if I could, sure. on sort of affordability. You know, I, I think the, he, the gentleman made an excellent point about um, sort of affordability and new homes in this area. And I think, um, you know, some of this is a little philosophical in terms of how we approach affordability when it comes to city building. But there is real value in preserving existing housing stock. And it's sort of the, you know, there's a, the, 
what a lot of people credit first urban planner Jane Jacobs talks a lot about existing housing stock is the cheapest form of affordable housing and maintaining that is the cheapest form of affordable housing. These homes are generally small. I think a lot of folks spoke to that, especially on the east side of Douglas. And so part of the affordability when it when it comes to this area in general is going to come down to preserving existing housing stock. So I just wanted to make that brief comment, but I, I think overall all those points are well taken. So um, I think let me know if you have any questions. Rather than devil in, getting into the detail, if y'all are okay, I think we just look to you, Jennifer, George, and the group to have the dialogue about the floor area ratio along with this to find out does it work, doesn't it work? I don't think we can decide that here. You've heard a comment. It sounds like you've already had some conversation. We're not privy to that at this point. So just have a dialogue and you can tell us or tell the, com the community meetings or is that okay with everybody? Just so that we're very clear on, what we're on that. Through. Okay. Because we can't decide that today. We, I mean, we've yeah, heard the concern. Add value then, yeah, but. You know, we don't know. I definitely understand why you've gone to the light, whatever the light plane, which, light you know, it's not. The, the, the confusing thing about the light plane is you can't look at it and figure it out very easily. You get, I mean, <laughs> there's no number. Like, I can't no look at it and figure it out not easily. Example. I think the visuals. We'll, we'll, we'll get some visuals. Yeah, so. Deborah can though. She she's good at geometry. I think I'm good at geometry. Yeah. I don't mean anything. But I, I mean, is that okay, Jennifer? It is, Mayor, and we'll be happy to have that dialogue. But I it it, it this kind of harkens to the, you know the crux of the matter here, and that is the underlying MF15 zoning district, which people don't realize that we have multifamily zoning districts, and that's really what we're trying to address, you know, in this area, because right. the pervious impervious also will not address that, so the the height issue. So we'll be happy to have that discussion, but you know the daylight plane uh, uh, theory is a direct result of that. So, so like I said, it was thought through. It, we did discuss it, and we will be happy to dis discuss it again. But I'm not okay, sure if we're going to be able to. We're not telling you to put it in. Right. I understand I, that, but, but I'm now just... you've heard the concern. I, I get it. The, the construction company has you know spec homes, and spec homes don't mean that you've got <coughs> you've got probably five, ten designs, whatever it is. But you're also getting economies of scale by buying certain materials and certain amounts together, and blah blah blah. And they know how, you know. So there, that's the affordability yes. piece of it. So after hearing that, now can I tell you there's going to be a lot of that over here? I don't think so. I think they're lucky that they have that opportunity. But you've heard it. <clears throat> you can have the dialogue. Thank you for the conversation. Appreciate it. it Everybody's going to talk about it again and try to figure it out. Absolutely. And, and they'll yep. come back and tell us. Can, can I just make one? Sure. Okay. You know, um, and I appreciated your comments. You know, I, I understand we don't want Dunedin to look like Seaside. Uh, we don't want it to look like what's uh, in, you know, what's that thing in Disney World? What's Celebration. It? Celebration. I mean, we don't want cookie cutter. Um, yeah. And I think, I think that there has not been an understanding, really. If you look at the Cooper Johnson, you know, you, there's so many different variations. I mean, they all don't look alike. It's just how you put them together. And now you've added mid-century. But a very, you know, a, a coastal vernacular can be very clean. It, but people don't understand how you can add all these variations in one single design area. And people, they don't understand that, that there's such a wide range of how you can make something look like. Uh, unless you really look over the Cooper, uh, if you look over the design book, and then you say, oh, well, I mean, you do have a broad range, and now you've added mid-century, which is very clean, um, so, you know, somehow I don't think there's a good understanding. It's like everybody thinks coastal vernacular looks like one thing, and everybody thinks Med Mediterranean revival looks like one thing, and it doesn't. Mid-century doesn't look like one thing. That's where your architect comes in to school. And we need that. I think we need to, ex you know, explain and educate on that, that we're not. It's not a cookie cutter. Yeah. You know, if I, and I don't know how we do that, but we'll, we 
maybe it's through the architectural review committee. I know that they have looked at adding an extra style or whatever, but I think we need some education on that. So um, coming back to the overall next steps that you described to us, um, I'd like to have a real clear understanding. All right, you're going to come back, and I get that, whenever, whatever that date is, I'm, and I'm fine with all that. Um, when I say next steps, I'm talking about, let's say we pass this. It's the next step after that I, that I want to know. So, I, you know, Commissioner Torunga brought it up. Other people brought it up, you know, this idea of somewhere else, like the light plane. I can see the light plane working for our downtown, too. I really do. And, um, you know, that's not residential. But, so I, I kind of want to know what our next, you're not going to have to answer this now, but I'd, I'd like to understand, because I think there's a lot of things we want to do, and there's only so many people that can do them. So there's a workload thing. Is it going after that spots, those little zones, right? Is it going after the historic district, which again is all over there? Is it using this concept to the next area we think is priority? And what are those priority areas? So you may not be able to tell us all that April 30th or whatever, but I would like you all to be talking about it because I think we're going to keep asking the question until you tell us what you think it should be. The next step. You know, like, over the next five years, we should do these five things in order. That, that's what I'd like to understand, bullet point. I don't need major discussions on it either. And I just, so however we get that information, you know, the zoning changes, just put, put a little, go out for cocktails and have it have a conversation. <laughs> Again, I'm not looking to have to have a major study on what we should do next. I just would like to under have a, a sense. So that, w and then we can communicate to that to people because our residents are concerned, as you know, about development and overdevelopment. And so understanding what we're working on and what's coming and being able to communicate that even if you don't know exactly when, helps people under, helps people feel better helps us communicate well with our constituents. So um, thank you. Anybody else have any final? Well, I, yes, I just one comment, and I mean, maybe this isn't a good idea, but it pops in my head, so I'm just going to say it. We've got a real-life example that Lynn is at Dow yeah. um, brought up um, about what, you know, they, what they, they bought a piece of property, what they want to do. You know, what's the impact? What, what you know? You know, because you made a comment that like, oh, we, we'd probably want to do this and we'd probably have to do this. So again, you know, part of part of putting this in is thinking about are we are there some unintended consequences of what we're having people do because of this? And they and they figure that out. So they do a different alternative. And we're like, oh, my God, I don't like that alternative. So, you know, I, I don't know if that's the right way to go, but there's a real life scenario that maybe we put in front of us and. And it helps us to understand the good, the bad, the ugly about this and what, what works and what doesn't. So, Well, and, we, and I, just for you and me just talking, I, I would say that there's going to be an impact. You can't change zoning. You can't change. But it is it going to be the impact? You know, I just want to make sure we've thought through it all. Right. And so there's, so for instance, and again, I totally appreciate everything that she said. I, I really do. But it's not realistic to expect that if you have a larger lot and a smaller lot that you can build the same size house on those. That's not, no matter what we do, because there are setbacks, because there are, you know what I mean? I mean, I don't think you could do that under our current code, whether we do this overlay or not, because of the setbacks and the requirements. So that's just not. Yeah, well, that's my point. What can we do today? What does this first, do to change? Yeah, and that, uh, that's yeah. exactly the point. Yeah, yeah. But, I, I, but we understand what we're really. These are the kind of real world examples we're right. we're hoping here in in two sure. weeks too. You know, really go through that. But one. we're but you know on the other hand, I, I I we're very happy that you've built a beautiful home, and that you want to build another one. I mean, so I don't want you to get the impression 
that we're not trying to support that. Um, we're just trying to protect the character of this area. And it's a tightrope. It is. Always it's a balance. balance. Yeah. It's and, a balance. Uh, we're trying to carefully walk that line and, and really hear all the comments and not go too far one way or too far the other way. It's, I think, I think Kenley Horn would say, all of these situations are a tightrope. Yeah. Okay. Anything else for the good of the order on this subject? Okay. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. Please thank you. talk to the gentleman with the apartments or the units and anybody else that wants to get some background information or whatever. And we look forward to you guys coming back to us. A lot of hard work and we really appreciate it. And I think the update was really helpful. It sort of just brings our mind okay. back into where are we? We're not cold coming into it the next time we talk about it. Maybe we should tell George happy anniversary. He's been yeah, here. Yeah, he's been here a whole year. He made it. He didn't quit. That's the thing. You didn't quit, buddy. I give you a lot of, a lot of kudos. Hopefully it's better. It's getting better. Very good. Uh, thanks, okay. George. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, I'm going to hop quickly. I'm going to go out of order. Uh, I believe the city attorney has something she wants to talk about. So let's get that out of the way because that might be a kind of a long discussion okay. item. And I okay. don't, you know what I'm saying? I want to give her the time she deserves. Well, and I, I'm going to try to make your the, the decision points that I need from you all very pointed today so that we can move forward. Um, so one item um, that you all have, and I know you didn't get it till yesterday, and there's even been a few typos and tweaks caught since then. You have a printed um, version of the ordinance that you discussed during your December um, work session regarding calling a referendum to present proposed amendments to the city charter. Um, one of the typos is kind of important, though, because it's I to the ballot I, question. I, found, I think I found two typos, but I know there's I found several. One. I mean, and but but so decision point. One thing I want you know to the first ballot question. Um, my my main question is whether it should refer to it as a city commission or restate city commission. Generally, I try to make as few changes as possible to the I actual thought it text. Was fine. But so it is grammatically correct. But I wanted to be sure that wasn't. And that confusing. is on page four of five. Right. Which is under the, the, I call it the red line version, but it's not really red line. The draft, right. The, yeah, the, the draft right under section underline. 6.03. There's a if few read it. typos in the, in the whereas clauses yeah, that are I being corrected, those. but I mean, I don't think those are as imperative for purposes of getting the direction of bringing back a first reading ordinance to you all. Okay, so um, it reads... Yes. As often as deemed necessary by the city commission, it shall appoint a committee from the city electors to review the city ordinances. Right. And the only question was if instead of it there, should say what about they the even though even though city commission is a singular body. Right. We could say they as well. Because it it did blow throw me off mm -hmm. when I read it. I think right. they could also be used. I almost like restating city commission, but I don't have a strong feeling about it. I, I'd like to city commission. I didn't have any issue, but I don't know. You're fine with the it? Um, or that's what I'll she's restate, asking. The restate it. the city commission. I mean, it, they, or city commission are the. So are the it would of. read, if we restate it, it would read, as often as deemed necessary by the city commission, the city commission shall appoint. I mean that's a lot of city commission, right? And that's why I was, thought it was kind of wordy. So, um, what if what if you just put as as often as deemed necessary, the city commission shall appoint a committee. That's good. So you you don't have to say deemed necessary by the city commission. It's presumed. Does that make sense to you, or do you mm -hmm. feel like it needs? That's a that's a way that's a way to take okay. out by and then make huh? even. Say it again. So it would read as often as deemed necessary, comma. comma. And then the word uh, it would right. say the city commission shall appoint a committee from the city 
electors to review the city ordinances. Well, aren't you good? That sounds pretty Well, bad. I hadn't thought about it, and it bothered me, but I wasn't getting into wordsmithing. Yeah. It bothered me, too, but this is the part that is important because this is the charter, and then that flows into the ballot language. Right, so right. I just want to make sure that we have yeah. that. And then, secondly, the, the, the ballot language on the second one is, is the one that has a typo. So see I on that same that. page where it says Ordinance Review Committee Appointments, I'm just going to go ahead and read what the question was corrected to shall section 6.03 of the city of Dunedin city charter be amended as provided in section 3 of ordinance 22 once we get a number to provide for appointment of an ordinance review committee as often as deemed necessary by the city commission and that's because obviously you can see there's a charter review um, reference in there that just bled over so the way that question reads again I'm just going to read it again which so wait wait which one are you? It's the second Bottom one? of page four. Right, but is it the second one you're doing? Yeah. Ordinance, under ordinance review. Review, yes, right. Okay, go ahead. Shall section 6.03 of the City of Dunedin City Charter be amended as provided in section three of ordinance blah, 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 to provide for appointment of an ordinance review committee as often as deemed necessary by the city commission. Yeah, that sounds good. Isn't that what you said? Mm -hmm. That is what, that's what I, I'm just reviewing. I'm rereading the ballot question since there was the typos as well in that particular section. Appointment. Okay, read that once. Uh, for appointment. Of appointment review of review an committee. ordinance review committee as often as deemed necessary by the city commission. Okay, we, th we've got time on this one. As you all remember from our, this just needs to be enacted by August to get it to the supervisor of elections on time, but I like working ahead. Yeah. Um, it allows you all to get information out to the public to be able to educate themselves on the amendments. So we will take that. I'm just gonna take those little tweaks and then we'll look at getting it before you for a first reading. Okay, so is everybody okay with the language between both of the charter? We're going from five to seven, which has already been yep. direction given, mm -hmm. and the ordinance being as needed. Yeah, as Dame Ness. I don't want to get too far down the road, make sure nothing's changed. You know what I'm saying? I that was the question. right. That was the direction that we tried. It to was apply. the direction we gave you. I'm and I'm not trying to change that direction. I just want to touch it. I don't want to get down to the reading of the actual ordinance, and right. then somebody's right. changed their mind. Well, I, I did have one question. Did we actually ask the ordinance review committee what they thought? Um, I spoke to some of them, but I don't know. They, we well, this is a charter. Were... This is a charter provision, so it wouldn't have really been within their scope and functions. But I think they did mm -hmm. provide a substantial amount of feedback about the challenges that they faced, given the volume that they had to um, try to complete. So I yeah, think I mean, that was their only comment, and that was in this discussion. Was yes, it was a lot to tackle, and and possibly, <laughs> and they they provided some informal comments, I think, individually, but they didn't feel comfortable including it as a recommendation, and I kind of agree because this is a charter provision, not an ordinance provision, so to try to, you know, keep their duties and functions clear. I but they, yeah. uh, I'll share with you. Yeah, that'd be great, because I think we had intended to ask them when we were here. Well, you had, we had talked had about so much going on, on that we them, So I, I reached out to a couple yeah. that I, I knew out. would have differing opinions so yeah. that I could hear. Well, what did you hear? Yeah. So one person who wasn't thinking too deeply but was involved on the committee said, yeah, I, I, you know, I understand this was sort of created back when we were trying to get the pigs out of the code kind of a thing. <laughs> um, Love those pigs. But the other person said, I'd like to keep doing it only if mm -hmm. you actually provided the experts to do it. Mm -hmm. Because nice. under, the, under the circumstances that they were given to do it, they felt it was it was pointless, not totally pointless, but it it wasn't as beneficial. They would have liked to you know have had an expert or two to review certain things, and that that was, you know, and if if that wasn't the point of an ordinance review. And so I actually walked away from that conversation thinking, okay, so if we do this as needed, when would we? What would spark us to want it to be reviewed? Would it be after a huge land development code thing? No, because you just did it. Right, we just did it. And we had the experts help us with it, right? You know, um, 
as mentioned in the whereas state clauses, we have legislative changes over and over and over again. So, but if there are changes, we have to make that's them. what the city attorney tells us how it has to work. So I'm not even sure, I don't know, but those were the two different. Yeah, I mean, that's a, and that's a well-founded first, because, because that is not a, you know, uh, yeah, it's not a very efficient way to review those type of technical codes, and we talked about that, with, but that would also, to your point, then if there's just a mandate that it be every five years and an additional expectation that consulting and other resources are going to be devoted to that, then that is a consideration that That's the commission, cost. right, that the commission's going to have to consider its budget for that year and the other needs that, that it's facing. So I think that's the maybe where part of deeming it necessary or desire, you know, and that it's a, it's a good time because maybe it hasn't been looked at in a while or maybe there's been, um, maybe there's just room in the, in the budget that year to do it. One of the ORC's recommendations was for a consulting team to be engaged to look at a potential rewrite of, of the, the land, land development code. code. So I think that's, you know, Okay. That, that well, also, you've, yeah. you've also determined, I believe you determined, <clears throat> which was different than previous determinations. I just that well that we that the land part of it is separate from the reg, just the code of ordinances. Well, the language the language used in the charter just says review the ordinances. Period, and that is those are. But I think at, yeah, at the time that that was enacted in 1970s, that was before you had comprehensive land planning. That was before you had, and all of those things are ordinances. So not just the land development code, but everything that goes into your comp plan, every single rezoning, every single land use map amendment. Those are all ordinances. So the volume of ordinances that the city produces in 2022 is different is in a different legal landscape than was enacted in in um the 70s now the reason why you can't use that as exclusionary of what the commission what the orc is going to review is because not lots of ordinances didn't exist yet that's the point of what the charter provision saying you're going to go back and review i think it's just a maybe a recognition that with that broad of an instruction and delegation um and and obviously some of the committee members were uncomfortable with the initial direction to not review the land development code. That was what sparked, they wanted to come back and review all of the ordinances of the land development code as well. Um, and then that was, you know, and then that presented those, those same challenges that were the concern of reviewing that type of a technical code, but it couldn't rely on the fact that the technical code didn't exist back in the 70s because lots of ordinances didn't exist. So it's both in terms of its breadth and the change of the legal landscape is what I think presented some of those challenges that they gave the feedback on. So traditional, to take that a step first, yes. further, the tr because that argument came up, you know, we it, in the past with the ordinance review, we didn't have them look at the land code because of the technicality of it. Mm -hmm. But then there was a debate about whether we had to. We were required because of the, the way it was written. But like I see in the future where there'll be kind of a certain thing, subject, that we will want to draw people in to review. It could be anything. It could be the historical thing. It could be whatever. It could be, it could be land stuff. It could... It could be uh, where we allow, you know, drugstores, whatever. It could be any number of things. And so I guess my question is, does this charter change? Are we required to make them look at everything, or can it be whatever we deem it to be? I think that would fall within what you deem necessary to be reviewed by a secondary ordinance or by a secondary citizens committee. Um, one of the things we tried to capture was some of the commission's discussion about the robust citizen input that you all have implemented in your decision making structure on the front end. So to your point, you might, if you've already gotten citizen feedback from certain advisory boards, you might want to then look at what are the instances where you want to have a, an additional citizens advisory board come back on the, on the back end to sort of review everything. And is that every single ordinance or is it only deemed necessary to be for some things that are 
um, maybe important, you know, what, what the commission deems as both, you know, important or hasn't had some, um, you know, Other robust citizen things. input um, in terms of an advisory board. But you all do have some of the most extensive public participation leading into your decision-making process as well. 30, what's the number, 36? 34. 34 with about different commission Only or appointed citizen advisory bodies that go that are supposed to be going into whether it ever becomes an ordinance okay. at all. So you're saying we'll have flexibility? I think so. Okay. Um, to do well within you know to your colleagues. Yeah, yeah. Everyone no, I mean it's got to be a majority of your colleagues, but yeah. I mean well, it's not because that was I don't want that argument to come back up again. Was my point. So, I mean, if I can just, so you're saying that if a situation arises that you could deal with, you could deem it necessary on a specific Right, ordinance. and you, you could do it more often than every mm -hmm. five years if that was the, I mean, that's the other thing, too. You, there's. You could have a specialized group that does one subject and another specialized group that does another subject, depending on their, right. whatever. Okay. Maybe if I may. Yes, and I've heard, I've heard all the conversations. I, I still go back, and I still have a concern that we're taking away something from the citizens that they, that they value, and they feel like they're engaged in. And I, I, and I heard that, you know I don't know how to address the technical stuff and having to bring in experts. I, I, I don't know how to address that. I know also part of the problem was just the amount of time it took, and by the time you're done with one it's time to start another one or you're already behind the ball on trying to start another one. And I understand that. And, and just to read in the audience, the, uh, if, we, if we wanted to maintain this, instead of once every five years, it's every five years upon completion of the previous one. So it's always gauged on when was the last one done five years from that instead of every five years you have to do it. Right? So if it takes four years to complete, it's not like, well, we got one year of reprieve and we've got to start it up again. It would be five years from that fourth date if we still thought, and then maybe expand on that ordinance to segregate it out to specific sections of the code or, or whatever, or sections of the code as deemed necessary by the commission or whatever. So, so so that it allows the flexibility of every five years, so it's not a burden on Nikki all the time, but and citizens get their input, and then we've also are managing the process because of the burden. Yeah. So it's uh, because well, it applies. It's not, it's not just me that we're. I mean, I. Well, and, and, yeah. I, and then apply that right. <laughs> no. Well, because it's even a burden on and, the committee and itself. I just yeah, be because scared. the charter thing is this right. big, and the ordinance thing is this big. It's right. a completely different. Right, and the and. Um, and I just want to be clear too that this change, this or this, I know we're clear on the structure, but this is calling for an election. So this change would not be made without a majority of the refer, a majority referendum of the city electors. So I, I get it. I get it. I, I understand that. But if this, it's only this only really. I'm concerned with the residents would really understand what this change is or they understand the value because they haven't participated in the process. You know, so it's, it, it is my concern. So we're giving something to the electors to decide, but it goes back to the tax question on the, on the, do they really understand the question on the survey? You know, do they really understand if they haven't heard these discussions and understand what the review is? Do they understand the question? Do they under, yeah, the, the, the impacts. And, and just if we're going to take something away from the residents, then, you know, it, it needs thought. I mean, that's, that's my concern. Mayor, if, if I may, we, we can't advocate, as you know, right. for anything, but we can certainly okay. send out, uh, develop Education. a communications plan to inform. Yeah. Okay. okay. Anybody else? Yes, so if I may, Nikki, so real, two real quick questions. If we wish to change, if the commission here wished to change anything that's in the charter, let's say some thing that states i don't know you can have stop can't have stop signs you can't have stop signs or whatever just say that was in the charter what would we have to do to change the charter a referendum election 
So the referendum is the referendum is important. It, it would I'm, I'm sorry, the charter review is a, is is a little bit more important. It would seem than what the ordinance would, because if we wish to change change an ordinance, what would we do? What would the commission do? Public hearings. Oh yeah, you. I mean, yeah. The the it depends on. I was to say it depends on what the ordinance was for. But yes, in general, charter. The your charter is always subject to ch change only by a referendum. Your ordinances have their own processes under 166 for how they can be amended and revised. Thank you. So, yeah. so for me, they're two different issues. And and as as Commissioner Gao was saying, you know, for the ordinance review, well, we can take care of that. But but. But what about what about the other now in oh, both but cases? But they're both in the charter, Commissioner. I want to be sh the the requirements are both found in the charter. Correct. So no, that's I, why this is presented as one correct. ordinance because it's 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 both yeah. an amendment to the charter. Correct. If that makes sense. Okay, no, I, I wanted to be sure that was clear. So as Commissioner Gow was saying, you know that that it's we can handle anything that, that we feel we need to handle in the ordinance. As if someone comes were to come before us and say, hey. We don't like this ordinance. We don't like stop signs being in this in the city. Well, then we can handle. It. I'm using that as a simple, silly right. example. On the charter, we can't. On the charter, we have to go for a referendum. So maybe maybe the charter needs to be handled a little different than what than what the ordinance does. I'm just suggesting, just asking, just understanding the point. Mm -hmm. And that's well. Right now, that would be it's the the direction was to present prepare a proposed. Amendment that would lengthen the charter review committee to seven years, recognizing that well, you know, the needs to be done. It needs to be being done periodically anyway. So regardless of whether they've finished, it's taken them four years to finish. Which, but like the mayor mentioned, it's a much smaller document, smaller, smaller shorter, document. punchier document, and it is the people's document. The charter is always subject to referendum by by the people. So um, and then, but like, to your point, commissioner. So then the the treatment of the ORC is a little different, and as deemed necessary by the city commission in the current proposed draft. But um, I'm going to make some tweaks based on what you all just talked about and recirculate. Like I mentioned, I'm not letting this delay, but we have until August. So it's good that we're having this discussion now and I'll send the revised language and then maybe y'all can take a look at it. And before we bring it back for first reading, yeah. um, send me any other co comments or thoughts that you have if you want to send them offline or we can have a, a little follow-up discussion to make sure we're in the right track before moving forward to first. If they're not big changes, then I'll no. have to bring it up again. Okay, but I'll just circulate yeah. it back um, to you all to make sure no one has any additional questions or comments. Commissioner? Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking about it, and I, you know, certainly respect what Commissioner Gao is saying. Um, but I think, I think, I, I really think I am okay with the deem, you know, what we deem necessary for review of the ordinance review code, because, I don't know, part of me, like, as we went through this process, it's like, we've got a new citizen group looking at things that we'd just done that we had extensive, like you say, on the front end input. And it almost seems, I don't know, it's like your parent looking over your shoulder after you've just done this very inclusive um, piece to get things in place. Um, and again, like we said, a lot of old stuff isn't still there. So, I mean, fresh eyes are good. I don't know, but I think as we deem necessary, I think I'm there. I, I kind of get what you're saying, Jeff, and I'm trying to still think through that, but I think I'm good with that. Um, you know, we take away the requirement of ordinance review, you know, I guess the charter, I think most most of it showed like a seven year, right? It was not unusual to be It was to between seven to 10, and yeah, you so all elected to go I think doing on seven. the lower end is the appropriate way for us. And okay. yeah, and in other cities, they don't even have ordinance review. Or they have it, uh, you know, back as on needed. request, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're like one of, one of two, maybe, yeah. that, that had it at five mm -hmm. years, I think right? it was Oldsma and us. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. well, it's because of... Well, John. Right. John Probably Hubbard. John. I mean, his I, cities were the ones yeah. that have all of this. So. And, and in, in that light, just what other cities are doing, we also have to remember that we are different from other cities, and there are reasons why we're different right. from other cities, and just... If we start down that road, well, they don't do this, so we don't have to. Well, all of a sudden, yeah, no, we're no. more like them than they are like us. I totally agree. But, you know. I, yeah, totally I totally agree. agree. Yeah. But totally I think agree. our extensive, what we do on the front end, <laughs> right, and is really fact, unique, and that's Dunedin. And the fact that yeah. Oldsmar, what, they have five or six committees? Yeah. And we have 30-some. So, you. you see? We're different. No, I can see why they would, you know, because they're, they don't have 
that. Well, okay. you know, this is important discussion, but as the city manager noted, once you know you do your ordinance, it, yep. this will be an educational piece. This will be up for everyone to decide whether or not they think sure. it's best for the city. But I do appreciate you know your your discussion and you know thinking about these efficiencies. And Commissioner Gal, like you mentioned, they didn't they um, that I think that opposite end of the spectrum is the you know, indefinite or, you know, no benchmarks in the charter for when it may be reviewed. And while a lot of communities had 10, a lot did have seven too. And so I think that's a recognition too, that you all are wanting to allow that work of the prior charter committee and ORC to be heard and received without immediately sending someone in after. Um, but I, I th think those are all good comments. Okay. The Thank other you. real quick things that I needed. Okay. Um, ju I just need your consensus direction. Speaking of ORC, because there are four topics that are left to come back to you from the ORC review um, that were directed in September of 2020, three of which have are substantial and significant rewrites to the city code. Um, that would be hourly engagements under our firm's um, engagement agreement. I want to explain why. These are the peddler sales solicitors um, chapter. So chapter 62 on sales, which is solicitations, peddling, um, uh, lots of First Amendment case law has occurred even since September of 2020 in that regard. And so I think looking at, since it is a total rewrite, including the enforceability of the ordinance that proposed rewrites were modeled upon back in 2020 has been challenged and, and had un some unsuccessful um, enforcement issues. So I would want to look at that really in, in depth. The, the BTR taxation rewrite was last updated in 2016 and their statutory limits on increases as well as reclassification standards and studies and the minutes don't reflect whether that analysis has been conducted and completed to incorporate those tax changes. And since it is a taxation issue, we have to make sure that it's squarely within the law, otherwise it's preempted. Um, and then finally, the transportation and mobility chapter. I wanted, what's not clear from the minutes is that if this is intended to explicitly exclude or include ride sharing companies such as Uber, if it's intended to include them, then I think there's some issues that we really need to review. If it's intended to exclude them, then that could be a shorter, um, this is the- I don't this remember is, what the change was. These were the transportation mobility, I mean, it was a whole rewrite of the transportation mobility providers um, operating within the city to have to obtain a license to operate within the city. And there are restrictions on that from the statutes yeah, I don't when dealing we with Uber that. and TNCs. No. Okay. No, I think, I think that was just to speak for all of us. It, it's like the Tiki ride bus thing that goes around, you know, you got to have a, you know, you're, it's group, it's that type of thing. Okay. Group transportation. But I don't remember what else is in there, so I can't speak intelligently. No, and I, I didn't. Mean, I wasn't trying to get on the details. It's just mostly if in if in your minds, as you were thinking of rewriting the mobility ordinance, it was capturing Uber or not so. capturing. Uber. We, and I'm using because we're not allowed to do that anyway. Exactly. We know that. Well, that's what we I knew want. that. Okay. Well, that's what I wanted to be sure, but that wasn't reflected in but the minutes or the changes. And I so. think in there was also the scooters, e-scooters. E-scooters mm, yeah. and those kinds of things might have yeah, been in there. Yeah, that's different. Mm -hmm. We don't want mm -hmm. That's yeah, a whole, we yeah. Are all of no, we don't want them. Okay, that gives me um, good direction. So I see nodding heads. Are you okay, or is everyone okay with me bringing back those three, recognizing yeah. they're going to have some hourly components? Yes. The the one about the, the sales, does that include campaigning? Is that the, what, uh, the one that includes campaigning? Um, that was, I think, the peddler and say, yeah, the, the the peddler chapter sixty two contained the um, discussion about exemptions for campaigning. But actually, I think that there there there's additional First Amendment issues that need to be addressed with regard to what you can regulate um, based on why someone is peddling. Thank well, that's a Thank you. funny verb. Um, that, but I think I have the. Thank you, um, Commission, and thank you for the time this morning. The last item, well, yeah. Before you do that, um, could someone send us the minutes from the meeting where we talked about that? Mm -hmm. Because that would really help. I mean, I, I just, I kind of remember, but I don't know. The minutes the from the, beat, from the. When um, we talked about that and gave direction on that, that way, you know, because I'm good with it. I just want to, well, 
we when we would have talked about those directives. We, I'm sure we yes. talked about them all. I together, have all right? three, and I can email them out, Jennifer, right after this um, to to all three of you what you talked about before. Now, yeah, and I that plan would be to, actually help when they brought when they're brought back before you. I'd want you to have that as well as the revised, you know, the, any revisions that we've incorporated as a result of the second Perfect. review. That's great, thank you. And I'm only doing this because I wouldn't normally even do a second review. Someone else has drafted it, it's gone to ORC, you've given direction, these just got pulled because there had been so many changes and updates that have happened, um, not just since that time, but even, you know, while they were um, maybe going back and forth. So I wanted to be sure those were captured. The last topic um, is not necessarily an hourly concern on or wanting to make sure I had direction under our contract, but is under, but is but relates to the the changes that are directed to Chapter 26 for code enforcement or code compliance. Um, one particular change was a change that would right, as right now the code currently reads that the board shall be represented by the city attorney's office. That's the role that we have served in since 2020. Um, that is, as I mentioned to a few of you, that's the role that, you know, consists in, in, if you represent the board, you don't represent staff or vice versa. Um, but it's appropriate and city attorneys represent the board in other communities. Um, if the, the change presented from the ORC and directed to be made by the city commission was to add the word not in between shall and represented. So the board shall not be represented by the city attorney's office. That change can be brought back before you. It's not gonna require an hourly review. What it's going to do is substantially change the processes that are we've been operating under. Um, so it would then prohibit us from, um, the city would have to get rep separate representation for the board. It cannot be an attorney from my office. We would be conflicted out. So the city would need to be looking at paying that person um, for their services or the city would need to go to some kind of a system where that the decision-making body is separately um, able to be represented. So the magistrate we system. We talked about it. Okay, okay. So the magistrate, I just wanted to be sure that was also that direction was given in March of 2020. That was before the RFP for city attorney was even on the street, much less awarded. So I wanted to be sure that that was the direction that you all wanted to continue to go in and that you know when we bring that change, that's gonna be effective immediately. So that will mean that code cases can't move forward until that either that um, person is in place to represent the code board or, to, or, or a magistrate is in place to hear decisions um, or make, you know, make, do the, conduct the hearings on violations. So why don't, why don't because I don't think we can decide that here. We haven't had a chance to think about it. Oh, yeah, no. I, Why I, don't? I, because I just we, wanna... are, we already gave direction, but in an abundance of caution, as you just said, we did it prior to going out for RFP for our new city attorney. And, you know, there could be other thoughts in all of that. So maybe, Jennifer, you and or Nikki put something together that tells us what needs to occur and what those costs might look like. And we might not know just some to of, reacquaint right. ourselves and the pros and cons. Yeah, that's yeah, pros, and, say, cons. The pros I, and cons. I know one of the thing, reasons we wanted to go in this direction is we wanted to make sure we felt there was a conflict of interest for our city attorney who represents us to go then represent the board and not our own, not our own people, not our like. George and, and they, right that's why staff is unrepresented at your hearings although they are well aware and they they can I've they've I've let them know that if at any time they wanted conflict counsel we would broach that to be sure that they had counsel for example if another attorney is representing a violator sometimes staff wants conflict counsel and that's what Largo does so I know that that's um but that's a different, you know, that's a different community. This is Dunedin, and I want you all to be able to make the decisions for what you want. What I didn't want was to bring forth that change, and you go, great, Nikki, that checks off all the last four boxes from ORC, but then we go, why can't we bring code cases? Well, because well, we got to go out for an RFP to get them counsel, and then that you didn't know it was going to be launching into, you know, some additional things that are, go that are going to change. Um, that structure, but we can represent, we just can't represent one or we, it's be one or the other. I think so. we've thought there was some huge conflict of interest and I think there was some other personal things involved in this decision. So is the commission okay with 
getting the pros, cons, the costs, and, and re-looking at this, or do you want to stand firm on the decision we already made? I'd like to do what you just said, and, and I'd just like to understand if there are some other options that you've seen in other communities that, you know, can kind of make it work and without going the full, the full route. Everybody okay? Yeah, I don't mind the revisit. <laughs> yeah. Are you okay with revisiting, Deb? Yeah, because, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I, I really want to have to think about this because yeah. I'm not really quite sure I'm ready to say you're not going to represent the code enforcement. And you're saying that we already came to that. Completely. We did, but for different reasons. And uh, that's, I mean, normally, just so you know, I would never allow us to revisit. I would, I would be kicking and I, screaming. I, We've made this decision. We're not, but this is very unique, and it was for very specific reasons. And so I don't think those specific reasons exist anymore. Well, and I wasn't sure if the direction, you know, didn't include we're going to do this and then we're going to, so now we need to get counsel for the board and we're going to go out for an RFP. I mean, it didn't seem the second step about what that effect would be and how to get the board representation um, would be, you know, was, was lacking. So I appreciate that, Mayor, because I did not mean this to be a no, revisiting I, I know of you your, didn't. Of I your know prior you didn't. direction. I know you did One last question. Yeah. Yes, if we decided to have two different attorneys, could one of your other attorneys in your firm no. firewall they and would do? Be totally no, well, I mean the county does no. that all the there time. No, there is, so is absolutely. I cannot represent both staff. And no one from my office can. Okay. My entire my entire firm is conflicted out. If we represent staff, we represent staff. If we represent the board, we represent the board. And that is how I that that that's that's just a bright line. Yeah. Is, this is that your line or is yeah. that that is the Florida bar and the Florida code of gotcha. ethics? Okay. That's yeah, gotcha. No, okay. not crossing it. Sorry. All right. So everybody, everybody, <laughs> I, mean, I, no, I no. really look at and how there's the not, and I know a lot. So that's why I asked the question. Yes. And that, there are certain there are certain Florida Except bar conflicts that can be that can be addressed that way. But this is both a. Um, this That's has been this has been opined on by the Florida Commission okay. on Ethics with we regard did. to when what the general counsel that's in house at a city what they can do who they can represent so this is very clear and if you're on one side of the fence not the other there is not a technical conflict which but I understand from the discussions leading up to this point that it was just uncomfortable and and also you know that the the city attorney's office at the time was doing more on the back end with regard to enforcement and collectability and, and yep. things like that that our office going on doesn't do debt collection. So I can see where if someone's both responsible for getting the, you know, imposing the fine and then is, and then is Collecting doing the, the collections, it can, different. it can, it can be a different, a little bit different dichotomy too. But so just take that, we'll bring back some data and some options for the commission to consider, but I didn't want anyone going, this was one word, Nikki, why haven't you brought this back? And there's obviously bigger things here that have been um, getting in place over the last year. Yep. So, thank you all so much for your time. That's all I have, and I appreciate your direction. All right, now we have one minute left, and we have several things to cover, which is commission discussions, city clerk, city manager, and commission comments. So is there any commission discussion? Yes. Okay, and is, is it anything that maybe could wait till the next meeting? Given the time, um, why don't I why don't I just start on it and then I can do it again some other time? But it, it's it's things are continuing to happen and we need to. I just want the commission to be involved in it. Okay. So you want me just to start? I'll just do an outline and just see where we want it. If we want want me to go further so just along. Just so everyone or? knows, at ten of one, uh, I'm leaving. <laughs> I wasn't you know, saying I wasn't stop. staying that long because I have a lunch. Okay, good. Yeah, I have a lunch thing, at so one. I, and that's it's what I'm just street, saying. Okay. I, well, I let have, me ask this question: Do other yeah, people have commission discussion items? Down. Let me I, just ask this. The, uh, I will forego. I have information, but no discussion. I, I have two small points about my liaison, but it'll take one minute. Okay. Go ahead, Commissioner. So the discussion I had two. Uh, the first one, the first one was uh, has already been discussed, in, but without any any determination, and that was that we have additional uh, communication within the city about. Um, I'll summarize it by saying, uh, who are we now, and who do we want to be when we grow up? And we talked about that a little bit about about are we a tourist 
city or what, what is really happening here so that we get some input from the citizens and the residents and then we communicate to them what's happening. And we, we talked a little bit about that, so I'm not gonna go into any of that at this point in time. Okay. But I do think that should be addressed. Um, not, not I can do that at another time. Second one is about the Dunedin Marina. Um, we all know that we received communications recently from a number of people about the Dunedin Marina. And um, I, I would like some resolutions on some of the things that they're, they're discussing um, I'm not able to plow forward ahead by myself about some of these things. They include things like um, rules, um, eliminations within the, within the water boundaries, uh, everything from pedestals to uh, to road concerns and parking concerns. But I, th I think at the last meeting, though, we did say to Jennifer, "Go ahead and go start working on these things," and she said she would. So I, I'm not sure what you're needing from us because she said she was gonna manage all of that, right? Yes. Didn't you? Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. and, and so this is gonna happen relatively soon. We're not following rules, okay? Mm -hmm. Whatever the rules there are that need to be followed, she was gonna go, because we twice now, I think, twice or three times, but twice we had the same two people come up and give us concerns. Right. We looked at you, we said, Jennifer, go address these concerns, and you said you would. Correct, and we are, and, and we need to engage the Marine Advisory Committee as well. In, right, in and they didn't meet concerns. in December or January, but they're mm -hmm. meeting in February. Correct. So, yes. Okay. So some of these, you don't need to, you don't need to ask the Marine Advisory if you ought to follow the rules, correct? No, no, yeah, but okay, any, other, any other things. Yeah, I'm, no. But I'm leaving, we, okay. we all gave direction to Jennifer. To so then I can talk with Jennifer about these things, yeah. obviously, yeah. which I have been. Okay. okay. Just wanted to get that out yeah, un underway. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I will I will pass on, on anything else for that, and then I do have something for the comments. Okay, why don't you go ahead with comments? You want me to do that? Yeah, that's, might as well. so that's the next session. Sure. So these are these are topics of concern. I was asked to address a gentleman that came up to talk to us about an occurrence about a that was specifically was talking. He was talking about an endorsement. And so I went back, I was asked by the mayor to communicate with him what was resolved here, that, that nothing had been done illegally. Um, I realized that that was not his question, but I did that. He came back to me and he said, um, John, that was, that was not my question. He says, I acknowledge that something about that, to that effect. So I'm gonna read just to make it short, really quick. Um, here's what he, Here's what he told me, and then here's what he finally wrote to me. And he said, Commissioner Turing has been kind enough to inform me at your request of a report by the city attorney saying that you, the members of the commission, violated no rules in publicly endorsing the candidacy of Honorable Ben Diamond of St. Pete for the United States Congress, which, uh, whose endorsement appeared in public on or about December 8, 21. Below is a copy of the press release uh, issued by uh, Ben Diamond that when he announces the endorsements, etc. At the last workshop meeting of the commission during public comment, it, I arose to uh, criticize the clear conflict that this endorsement represents and to ask you as a city's legislative body to act to resolve that conflict. At the time, I believe that you, the commissioners, and the mayor in particular, deliberately deflected my uh, criticism by suggesting that I was claiming that you violated the letter of the law not of the municipal, Dunedin municipal uh, ordinances. So he's been here before doing this. He, he has brought the same subject up before a couple of years ago. He said, I did not and do not claim that you did so. In fact, I said at least twice during my uh, statement that I support your First Amendment right to endorse whom you will. The conflict arises because your endorsement clearly violates the spirit of the relevant municipal ordinance, which goes to great length to exhibit the right of citizens of Dunedin to behave in exactly the same way that you did. I cite what I believe to be the critical language in the section 26202, unfair campaign practices in the city ordinances he writes, gives all, gives all four of those. The one he, the, that he's really talking about is participate in any uh, partisan political office 
functions, provided, however, that such candidate or agent of a candidate may register and rule and vote as a member of a political party and may attend and speak at a political party function or some or, or an event provided that all candidates for the city office have been invited and permitted to participate in the same manner and to the same event. Any person committing an act prohibited by this section shall be guilty of unfair campaign practices, goes on. Although a narrow reading, and here's his comment, although a narrow reading, I'm almost done, no reading of this language would support the contention that you individually were not candidates at the time and therefore not burdened by the letter of the law. It is obvious to anyone who publicly endorses a partisan, a partisan candidate, especially while displaying party affiliation, is a violation of a spirit of nonpartisanship that this ordinance and others appear to encourage in Dunedin. Given that you have violated the spirit of nonpartisanship, which was one thing he was talking about to us, I believe that single fairness should uh, uh, should lead you to admit that the ordinances, such as the one cited, impose an unfair burden on the First Amendment rights of the citizens of Dunedin, such as yourselves and me, and should lead you to rapidly take affirmative action to remove that burden and restore those First Amendment rights by eliminating this ordinance and other similar ordinances from this municipal code. Thank you in advance for your kind attention and swift action. He has so stated, what are you looking for out of reading us this? What do you... He asked me, you asked me to go to him. And let him know what and let him know. And so he asked me to come back and state to you that you didn't answer his question. When I, when I delivered... Okay, so you could email that to us so that we can have the, the appropriate time to reread that and understand what those things are. Well, I will then. Thank you. Um, anything else? Because that, that doesn't fall under comments. That falls under discussion. Comments are generally about our, our uh, liaison positions. Shouldn't anything he, else? Shouldn't he send that to Nikki? Well, he should send it to everybody. But, I mean, I, you know... I, I don't know what would the purpose of reading somebody's on, email is. But, here. but Nikki opined on that, and so it would seem to me and, that. And he's using words like clear conflict. But again, now we're in commission discussion, which we said we were going to be quick about, and we've spent 10 minutes at commission yeah, and discussion. I didn't take, and I don't, I didn't take that. I actually took the comments to be saying they're not looking for, and, and that's, I'm not. I don't yeah. usually set, have a resident send an email yeah. and then and then Nikki goes and gives that resident a, a No, nobody's asking you to do that. This is for us. Yeah. But yes, you should be included on that email. Um, That's okay. Are there is there any other commission discussion because we need to move off of discussion? Commission comments also include basic updates. And I was given an assignment, you gave it to me, and I went and did it, and he came back and he asked Any me, other comments? From you, Commissioner Tornbeck. Okay. Nothing. Uh, Vice Mayor, anything? You said you were foregoing yours? Uh, well, I just want to keep telling you that the trashy treasure coming up. And uh, I know Vanessa is working very hard on the trashy treasures. And then I was looking through my schedule, and trashy treasures, come on. It's the March 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th? I think that that's correct. But... Um, just to tell you of some of the things that have come on, you know, have already come in, that I am eyeing is a Scaparelli hat. So I'm telling you there's some wonderful treasures, so everybody get ready for trashy treasures. Opening night is like 10 bucks, and you get hot dogs, and it, it's a great time, and then it goes into the next day, it's particularly for more of your art supplies, and then the next day is half off, and then they'll finish up with one day where it's just like, we want people to come and get the stuff that did not go through the sale. So it's a big event. Anything? Uh, yeah, I'm eyeing that same hat, so oh, no. watch out. <laughs> Fisticuffs, I think, we're gonna come down to. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, one of the things I want to do is liaison to the schools. I at least wanted to uh, periodically, monthly, or every time the opportunity presents itself, showcase one of the schools. 
And so uh, this morning would be Dunedin Elementary and the idea that they are one of 26 schools uh, through some um, funding from the federal government that allow for free full-time uh, pre-K. And the real significance of that is that they currently have a half-a-day program, but because of the socioeconomic makeup of, of those students, that a lot of those parents aren't able to do the half-a-day because they can't take off t time off of work, et cetera. So this allows the, school, the, the, the pre-K uh, students, children, to be in school. And so there is uh, certainly data that shows without this, there is social, emotional, and economic success for those who attend and those that don't. So this creates more of a level playing field and, and will provide a much stronger social, emotional, and economic progress for the students in Dunedin. So I love that. Uh, and then secondly, just to let you guys know that uh, I'm going to be in Tallahassee three times this legislation, this legislative session. Uh, one is the 15th through the 16th. I'm going with PSTA. And so that is a workshop day. And so I would love to have your permission to miss that, that workshop if I can. Um, that also means that I'm missing uh, the workshop for the overlay. Sure. And um, that's unfortunate, but sorry about that. And then the 21st through the 23rd of February, I'm up there with the Suncoast League. And then again with the Suncoast League, February 7th through the 9th. And so uh, those don't keep me from doing anything as far as city matter. Everybody okay with excused absences for Commissioner Gale? Mm -hmm. Yes? Absolutely. Yes? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you and thank you for the representation. And if there's any issues you want me to take with me, let me know. Well, sure. Um, Work with Nicole. Yeah, but Carrie Wyatt, I mean, I want to say she's just amazing. Oh, she Dunedin Elementary, wonderful. what she has done mm -hmm. for that school, and she's going to retire by yeah. next year, and I'm telling yeah. you, she yeah. is a powerhouse. And she is also very appreciative of everything the city has she done for them. Wonderful. So it's very nice. So thank you. So I'm not eyeing the hat. Um, oh, definitely good. Not. So maybe five <laughs> up here I can... Um, uh, amazing thing that they're doing with the pre-k um, it makes a huge difference for the kids and the working parents um, particularly um, my two things were Toronto Blue Jays just praying that the lockout you know ends here um, we if the lob, lockout does end um, within you know I, I don't know I, I was going to call Shelby before today's meeting I talked to him last week uh, he was very hopeful so there was definitely some movement um, I just saw something yesterday, like within the next seven days. I if thought they the can, lockout was done. Is uh, it? They're, they're, they're promising, so unless there's something late breaking it, it's not done done. And until it's done done, the pitchers don't go into action. And when the pitchers don't go into action, there's a whole 30-day. So it has the ability to impact spring training. Um, but I, I'll, I'll double-check today with Shelby and see if there's anything new. Um, if we are able to stay on track with our spring training, uh, February 26th, and, and he did feel like he was hopeful. And maybe if we lost anything, we might lose a week. So, you know, just, but hopefully we can stay on track. February 26th is scheduled to be opening day. If that stays on track, February 24th is the tentative Welcome Back Blue Jays event, which would be held at the stadium. Um, Blue Jays would be involved again this yeah, year as Andrea they were. to get all that stuff Okay, on the I'll get that on the calendar. And then the only other thing, have you, have we, um, the Future of the Region Awards from TBRPC, do you know if, if anybody's gotten that from staff? I can double check when I'm. I haven't seen. No, we were the League of Cities Municipal Achievement Awards we're working on right now, but I haven't seen that. Okay, I'll double check too. I have a meeting, but but I just wanted to check because I thought they were going to be out by now, and I just thought we should go for the do the Gladys Douglas Prize. Absolutely. Um, so you know, so I'll double check when that is. I was thinking they were going to have them out by now, but maybe they're not out. We're going to get that that date is uh, again that should be on your calendars April. I don't know if it's 6th, in there, I but will you make is, sure it is? Yeah, April six is the. Mm -hmm. Future of the Regions Award luncheon. So, okay, that's all I had. I, I just need to tell you that on the 24th and the 25th of uh, February, of February, you know, I will try very hard, but you know, I may miss a few, like a week maybe. Oh, because you're my hip. Your hip. Oh yeah. Replacement. So be on top of that. I mean, I'll do my best. Mm -hmm. Could Could anyone carry me on a litter? <laughs> <Certainly>. <laughs> well, we can take. I mean, we. Can, I mean, it's. 
ADA accessible at the stadium, yeah. so it's not like it can't. We can't get you there in a if you're, you know. Right. Yeah. We'll get you there. You want to go? We'll get you there. Deborah, what date are you having it? Twenty first. Yeah, I, I I don't see you being at the stadium. <laughs> okay. Cross her off. <laughs> I, I'm going to hold off all of my things that I have for updates and everything, but, um, you know, that's for all for the good of the order. Thank you, everybody. It's uh, quarter of one. We are adjourned. Thank you for watching this City of Dunedin government meeting. If you'd like to review any part of this meeting or watch any previous government meeting coverage, you can watch these meetings online anytime through the city's website, DunedinGov.com. Stay connected with everything Dunedin. Follow the city on this channel and on the city's Facebook page, through Twitter, and on the city's YouTube channel. Thanks again for watching this Dunedin Television production.